Thank you. Good evening. It is 6.30 p.m. and I'd like to call the June 2nd, 2021 special board meeting for the budget workshops of the Niles Main Library Board to order. Please, please take the roll. Here. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item four on the agenda is public comment. Susan, do we have any public comments for this evening? Here? Yes. Yes, you're not leaving. Okay. Good evening, Library Board. Last night, Trustee King Adams asked a question about what your vision of the library is in the next two years. This question was unfortunately not answered. I believe that it is an extremely important question and one that many in the community are wondering about. As I hear your proposals for cutting hours, eliminating outreach services to schools, and up to nine senior centers, and diminishing the award-winning library newsletter, I am confused as to what your view of the library is and what you want it to be. There's a very popular program at Calder School called Vanish for Fiction, in which a library comes into the school once a month and hosts a book talk session for the students. These students are so invested in the program, they give up their lunch and their recess to sit in the boardroom to eat and talk about books. Not only are they talking about books, though. They can, of course, do that with their teachers and the school librarian. But they're also forming relationships with the librarian at the public library. They're learning that, they're, that they are special enough to warrant a visit from outside community leaders. They get to feel a sense of community when they walk into the library the next time where they have a relationship with the librarian. And they may even hear a librarian say, hey, I know you just read that one book. Maybe you'd like this other book. This is priceless. It is what a library is. It fosters community. It extends the love of literacy. And by the way, I was lucky enough to sit in on a few of these Spanish Perfection events during the lockdown portion of the pandemic. The library building was closed down. But the librarian still attended online Spanish Perfection events with the students. It was wonderful. This is just one program that I happen to be personally connected to. But I am confident there are other outreach programs at other area schools, as well as outreach programs to seniors in our community who may have trouble getting to the library on their own. This is what a library does. I heard Trustee Schoenfeld talk about outreach programs to St. John Riva and other area schools at last night's session. I applaud her ideas for the library to collaborate and engage with area schools. And I question why the budget proposal seems to include eliminating the programs that already are already in place to do just this. I also hear a lot of discussion about low attendance at library programs. Isn't it part of the board's job to encourage participation and community engagement with the library? Instead of cutting funding for the award winning newsletter, which serves to educate the public about the collections and programming the library offers, shouldn't the board be encouraging this marketing effort? How does the board expect the public to increase its engagement with the library when this sort of funding is cut? Again, I don't understand the vision this board has for the future of the library. When I think of a library, I think of a place that not only houses books, it is also a place for cultural enrichment, community engagement, a safe space 
for all people to feel welcome. It's a place that can open people's minds and give them opportunities they might not have otherwise, get for reading or trying out new technology, engaging in a maker space, or being able to meet up with like-minded people, people in programming that interests them. I know that's why I think the library should be, but I still don't have an understanding at all of what this board believes a library should be. Maybe you can answer Trustee Keenan's question and let us know what your vision is for the next two years of the Library. Thank you. Thank you. Sanders. Sanders, sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I moved here to Niles about five years ago, and I've been in the area my entire life. I grew up in Gladstone Park, and I went to Notre Dame High School, and it was a really big deal when this library was first built, and we were able to actually get access to it with our Notre Dame student IDs. Um, recently, I have been utilizing more of the technology that's been offered from the library. I've taken some 3D printing classes. I've learned some AutoCAD. Uh, I've been able to use your cameras, the GoPros, to film some of my events for some uh, advocacy work that I've been doing. And I'm concerned that the direction that the board is taking cutting all of these services and events and training is going to adversely affect the population of Niles' ability to learn new skills especially in this environment that we have for some people who lost their job. And so I just want to plead with you to make sure that you guys don't cut any of the services or the technology offered by the library to make sure that it's still available to the public and we're able to use it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And then we have um, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz, you have a four comments. Uh, the first one is from Sylvia Mallon. Uh, she says, I am the parent of two children at St. John Brebeuf School here in Niles. I wanted to send a quick note voicing my concern for reports that have been circulating indicating that school outreach programs via the library are in jeopardy. I think the children very much enjoy these programs and it would be a shame to see them go away. I know my own children have participated in various programs and would be crushed to see them eliminated. I just wanted to send a note to implore the board to carefully consider the impact that removing these programs would have on the children of our community. Being a part of these programs keeps kids interested and excited to go to the library. Second comment is from Elizabeth Lynch. I was appalled last night when I heard that some of the trustees are considering eliminating outreach to our schools and daycares. What could be more fundamental to the library's mission than promoting early literacy, partnering with teachers, and engaging students? Removing outreach services will not only diminish our library, but hurt our schools. Teachers and school administrators will tell you that strong connections between libraries and schools are an essential part of the learning environment. If we want our children to be readers, engaged citizens, and lifelong learners, then we have to show them that we value their learning in and outside the classroom, in our schools, and in our broader community. If our library is going to become a shell of its former self, abandoning even core services like school outreach, then our community will never be, quote, the best place in America to raise a family. The third comment is from Simon, S-C-Y-M-O-N-K. Um, call a halt to this budget process. I watched the meeting on Tuesday night and it is obvious that it is a complete charade. Those staff members are making sincere presentations to the board to generate productive conversation. It is very obvious that the decisions have already been made and no presentation can change your mind. It is a complete waste of time and it will only serve to give the majority board members an opportunity to say that each department made its case except you are just are not listening. Instead, you are talking about cutting holiday cards from $200 to $50. Who cuts holiday cards? You are talking about restricting the open hours because we are in the middle of a pandemic. Along with everyone else in this state, I disagree with your assessment. We are at the end of the pandemic in Illinois. The state will shortly move to phase five, which means that the state will be completely open. 
The library should follow the lead of the state and completely open as well. Your instincts to persist with restricted hours are completely the opposite of what should be happening here. You are using the reduced circulation as a cudgel to flog the staff members with. It doesn't seem to register that certain statistics have shown more than a 50% increase since the darkest days of the pandemic through April. You should be taking action to encourage the residents of the district to come to the library to explore the new materials and take opportunities to learn a new skill. They will have that opportunity only if the library is open. The circulation statistics will increase most assuredly. So open the place up for crying out loud. I didn't pay property taxes all of those years just to have a huge deserted building on Oakton. You are broadcasting an image of ignorance and small-mindedness through your actions. You are telling the world that we are an unfriendly, uncaring place. You are giving potential real estate buyers second thoughts about the community. You are embarrassing yourselves, the mayor, the village trustees, and the residents. So much talk for someone who is not in the trenches with you. Here are some suggestions. Number one, tell the staff how much you would like the budget to be for the upcoming fiscal year. Number two, tell the staff that it is up to them to make the choices which will result in a favorable budget outcome. Three, let the professionals decide what is best. Four, let the professionals present their solution. Five, pass their solution. They all seem perfectly competent and willing to put in the work and make the allocation choices. I can't understand why you would want to be associated with cutting library access for the general public or why you would want to be associated with cutting professional development or memberships to professional organizations which serve to make improvements the library users will enjoy. No doubt it will take a little more time, but it is the right solution. What should you do instead? Try focusing on strategy and turning a course into the future that makes us all proud of the cherished institution which you are guiding. Strategy is hard. It is a lot harder to think in the abstract and stay away from the tactical exercise of cutting unimportant things like holiday cards. Thank you for listening. And the last one is from Kathy Toy. I would like to ask the board to reconsider cutting the outreach programs to our seniors, school-aged children, and daycare centers. I believe you are doing a terrible injustice to our library community if this service is eliminated. Many seniors in the nursing homes rely on our outreach program to receive their books. Children in our library district look forward to the visits from our school liaison. Our library programs are promoted through this endeavor and the love of reading and coming to our library are instilled in the children at a very young age. Children at the daycare centers enjoy their visits from our library staff. Please consider what impact this will have on our seniors and children of our library community. The parents of these school children pay taxes to the library and I believe should continue to receive these services. Thank you for your consideration of this request. Okay, thank you, sir. Can I please ask you a question? A simple question before we get into the business. Sure. I was just curious. Do you consider yourself and Joe a committee going to all these things together through the library? I'm just curious. I don't understand the question and I don't think it's appropriate right now, but if you want to clarify, I'll spend a few more minutes. Uh, well, the two of you are teamed up, going to different meetings, going around the library. Like you're some kind of committee. I was just curious. I'm sorry, curious. I don't understand what you're talking about. Susan, do you understand what she's trying to convey? I don't get it. I cannot speak for Trustee Rosansky. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't uh, understand well, I know that board members can have you know have committees. And since the two of you are going everywhere together in the library and with the budget and making decisions and delivering them to our house like they're done meals, I was just concerned. Okay, that I can address. That I can address. Okay, we're not a committee. The treasurer reviewed the budget that we received and made recommendations. Since the, the recommendations weren't sent to the trustees, he dropped them off for your review. As a board of trustees, we all have a say in the decisions that are being made. These are recommendations we're asking the staff to present. They 
the purpose for them to present is to explain their departments and then to give us input and feedback regarding the recommendations we made, which helps us better understand the decisions that will be made. That's what this process is all about. Thank you. But does the letter that states the that we were given by Joe states that the board has told the director to do this, this, and this. I don't want to go into details of right now on what it said, but it made it sound quite clear that the board had made a decision and the board hadn't even heard about this until Joe drops it at my door. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, okay, and tomorrow I will bring the letter and I will tell everybody what it says well, and let them wonderful. hear that what it be says. Wonderful. And if, Thank if, you and I will. And if there was a mistake and it said the board? Yes, it did. We can clarify it again. All of you are trustees. Each of you has, has a vote and certainly has an opportunity to discuss all of these matters. That's why we have three workshops scheduled. And instead of arguing with each other, I'm not trying to argue. Sarcastic, I'm just stating the fact excuse that me, the past two weeks, excuse me, we have been May told. I finish? Go ahead. Let's finish. have some valuable dialogue and get to the root of these issues. That's the purpose of a workshop. But I understand you're upset, and whatever you received that was improperly written, I'm sure we can correct it. The board does not make a decision through one person. Each one of you makes votes and, and, and makes your own decision. Well, so now that I've clarified that, can we move on for yes. tonight's presenters? Yes. Thank you. Item five on the agenda is new business for discussion and gathering of pertinent information regarding each department's 2021-22 budget. IT services is the first department on the agenda. And the presenter for IT services is supervisor which Rich Welcome, Rich. Thank you. Hey, Rich. Okay, is this supposed to be the card? You know, because it starts with staffing. It's three, them yeah, there is no one, there is no two. There is no one or two. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I'm starting in the right order. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to verify our guidance in the correct order. Thank you. Oh, I just want to make sure you're ready. Good evening. My name is Richard and I am the Information Technology Supervisor here at the Niles Main District Library. I'd like to thank the board of trustees for holding this budget workshop with library administration and the department supervisors. This evening, I will go over the IT budget and answer your questions. My technology and library journeys are very much intertwined. Uh, I began over 35 years ago. Uh, with 1985, my family moved to Niles. I attended St. John Greenwood School. One of my first mentors, Ken Williams, instilled in me a love for technology. That same year, I also began volunteering at the library's newly created computer lab. In 1996, I became a computer lab assistant, and over the next 25 years, I've worked my way to the IT services supervisor position. I still live in Niles, and I have dedicated my professional life to the library and its mission to serve our residents. The IT services staff consists of myself and one full-time IT specialist. We are responsible for the design, the operations of the library's computer networks and its security. We maintain internet connections through Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi networks, local area networks. Uh, we are responsible for integrating third-party products into the network successfully. 
We work with all departments to meet their technology needs by selecting, installing, and supporting all the library's computers and technologies for residents and staff. We support many systems, including the email, phone, building security, HVAC, pay for print, library automation, remote online subscription resources, credit card payments, and more. We strive to create and maintain a smoothly functioning environment where all the staff and residents' technology needs are met. We strive to always make decisions based on input of the stakeholders, including the staff, residents, and the board. We also take advantage of nationally sourced joint purchasing agreements, grants, discounts, donations, whatever possible, to help offset technology costs. I'm happy to report that over the last five years, the library has been awarded over $211,000 in federal e-rate grants to support internet access, provide a better Wi-Fi, and for land infrastructure upgrades, such as network cabling, switches, routers, firewalls, uninterruptible power supplies. We have already applied for another 48,000 HPT rate grants for the 2001 fiscal year. IT services always questions purchase requests and looks for the best use for our residents' phones. Most recently, we have been updating the voice technologies of the library, and in doing so, we'll be able to decrease total yearly voice service costs by 50%. We are also recommending delaying computer replacements beyond the projected five-year cycle that the equipment is in good working order and able to continue to function effectively and to be updated with the latest OS versions of MS Windows and other software needed for Microsoft for library operations and public access computers. In fact, most library computer monitors are 10 to 12 years old, as we did not replace that component the last refresh cycle five years ago. Staff will easily say that IT always looks to maximize any investment made in technology, hardware, or software. As an established community library supporting a service population over 57,000 residents, Technology's role affects all aspects of library operations serving our residents. I thank you for this opportunity to work with you to secure the funding needed for our mission to the residents. We'll move on briefly to review the various budget schedules and pause to answer any questions. The first schedule is uh, what I have in front of me, as well as you have, is uh, three staffing. Uh, as you can see, there is myself and uh, Technology specialist Greg Allen. Uh, you have any questions regarding the staffing? Yeah. Uh, for professional development, uh, IT training. Uh, every two years, uh, biannually, we request uh, continued of education for not the regular programs that we already have access to, uh, not only the staff, but also the residents through programs or online resources such as before Linda.com, now it's LinkedIn Learning. Uh, these are more specific towards servers and network operations. So things that uh, the infrastructure for our um, VMware solution. So uh, the clustering of the servers that we have in the back, uh, Microsoft Office administration, uh, that, that's what this type of uh, training is. And it covers uh, both of us, so two people for two years. And uh, you don't have to go anywhere. Uh, we can stay here in the building, uh, remote access to it. And uh, it's not one class, but it's all their classes. Um, so what we try to do is uh, pack the best value that we can, as opposed to cherry picking this program or this software that they will have a class. Um, we try to get the entire package. That 4,000 is actually, uh, uh, it's about 3,000 per year, but we do get a, a highly discounted rate because of uh, any questions? Sure. About training like the MS office. Um, so, is that something new that's being implemented for staff throughout the library? So, when I spoke about our training, it's the back end Microsoft Office 365. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're uh, a lot of things. The library is able, as a government agency, uh, to be able to take care, of it, take advantage of special programs. And some companies, such as Microsoft, uh, offer academic pricing um, or donations or discounts uh, to public libraries. So we actually don't pay for 
thousands of dollars that, uh, say, a business would have to pay for to have Microsoft Office 365, which is our email solution. Uh, it also provides access to uh, and cloud storage uh, for staff, which came in very handy during the last year. Um, and what this training does, it provides us access to administer that on the back. Uh, it's an evolving platform. It continuously is being updated. And so we continuously need to take refresher classes to make sure that we're in understanding of how to administer that service. Right, so I guess that's what I was getting at. In order for the library staff as a whole to be able to use those tools, you have to be trained in how to do yes. it so that you can then teach them. Yes. So this really isn't very optional in my viewpoint. That's just me. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and this is also the software that we use as trustees, right? When we open our email and we see all those other things, that's the same thing. Yes, it is the same thing. Right, thank you. So moving on to the six, schedule six is uh, software licenses. Uh, we have this organized in such a way. So over the course of the last evening and tomorrow uh, and tonight, um, you'll notice that the departments don't have in their schedule the software. Uh, we've consolidated it uh, under IT so that we know what is actually being installed, that we're not going out and buying one or two pieces of a program and maybe installing it all over the place. Uh, we have it all licensed uh, correctly. Um, and then we try to take advantage of any kind of discounts that are available either on the local level, the state level, or the national level. Um, and so it's organized by uh, IT services, either uh, wide ranging that IT supports either on servers, uh, security of uh, computers, that type of things. Some of these things are annual, some of them are three, four, five year contracts. And you'll see there's missing spaces and there's notes that indicate um, why it's missing and when it's going to be reviewed next time. Um, so this software uh, budget line does unfortunately fluctuate from year to year uh, because of those things. Um, you'll notice uh, some of the things that I'd like to highlight uh, under the IT part, there are three uh, uh, E-rate grant requests. So the amount that we've requested is actually just uh, a portion of what the cost of that particular software renewal uh, service is. Um, the rest is being requested uh, through a federal grant. Um, so that's what I wanted to point out there. Um, on the second page, you'll see it continues on to IT manage. These are um, specific software pieces that different departments use. Um, in the course of operations, um, some of them are for patient computers as well, uh, namely the Adobe Creative Suite, which is a, a pretty expensive program um, that allows uh, the digital services staff to provide to uh, the residents access to these uh, wonderful creative programs. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with these, but some of them are uh, graphic design, web design. Uh, video production. Um, so that's, and, and we do that with the state government's uh, discount. Um, so even though it, it is a, a substantial price, um, we try to get the best price that we can. Um, and then the all staff automatic. These are items that we, uh, they renew annually. Um, so unless uh, you're making major changes between vendors, uh, and we do review these to make sure that, um, you know, we're not, uh, just kind of an autopilot. Uh, so that's something that um, consolidating the software into one department and having me look at this um, allows administration and IT to be able to, you know, make sure that we're not kind of venturing into the weeds when it comes to software. Um, because I think even at uh, the $100,000 price range, it is a substantial amount of money. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're very much aware where that money is going and how it's being uh, utilized and it's being utilized at the best possible way. Um, there are any questions I can answer? Yeah, I have one. Yes. Uh, Rich, you did mention grants. Yes. Usually when you put in for grants, you get most of them? Uh, yes, once in a while. Um, See, maybe once we did not get a grant that we requested, mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, we did. Uh, so the way you've got it planned, a lot of these things that you talked about yes. covered with the grants. 
Uh, well, there's well, some, yeah, in the first page. Yeah, usually it's for hardware. There is some software in here that uh, either. Um, so this the firewalls, for example, uh, there's a software component to that, and uh, we purchased it originally five years, and that was part of the grant. And now we're requesting additional years of service mm -hmm. because the hardware can last. Uh, it's operating well, and it has a service life that is beyond the first five years of its installation. And so we we're so for that we'll I'll just want to point that out. It's, you know, about six grand that we have to pay, and the federal government will uh, we have a grant out request for three thousand one hundred thirty two dollars. Uh, Usually, the federal government grant that is the E rate grant administered by the Universal Services Administration, overseen by the FCC, um, they they look towards the schools that the library services. So, uh, the library services uh, multiple school districts, uh, the largest school district being District 63. Mm -hmm. uh, those school districts, they have to report. Uh, back to the government how many students are part of their national lunch program. 50% uh, or more in District 63 of the students, um, they qualify for the national lunch program. And so that reflects on the E-rate program as an 80% discount for the library. So typically we have 80% that is uh, federal government funding for these particular very specific categories and items. Um, there's a lot of paperwork that has to be done with it. Um, and 20% the library country. Okay. Next question, since you brought up it pertains to the schools that we serve. If outreach is cut to those schools, will that negatively affect us? Well, part, part of it is that we need to be able to serve, service these schools. So it's not just a matter of the, uh, the, People the mathematic there. matrix of applying, but also that we have to be available to service that community. Okay. And that's what we're doing. So if for chance that does get affected, if this shouldn't affect your grants, hopefully. Uh, it might. Uh, I know there's a part in here that we'll touch on later of uh, not doing a particular uh, project and that would possibly affect that particular grant yeah. this year. Yeah. Um, I know that certain things you apply for for the grant you have to do, otherwise you don't get the money. True. Yes. I understand that. Well, thank you. Other? You're welcome. Uh, I have a question. I'm just curious. What is the under the automatic windows, the black cloud? Yes. Cloud? So that is our financial software that allows us to pay our uh, vendors. Okay, thank you. Yes. How many computers do we have on site here at the library? Close to 200. You have 200? Yes. During the pandemic, were they all utilized, or how were you? We shut them? down uh, most of the computers. Uh, we kept on we kept computers available for staff that needed to have remote access to them to do uh, critical operations and operations that were only on those computers. Um, so that way, we did not have an electricity, you know, output. Why, why have these computers turning on? The patron computers, for example, um, even when we opened up, and even to this day, you will see that we do have them disconnected. Uh, only the ones that are being used are available. And at some point, we hope that very soon, we'll be able to uh, have all of them in service again. And then in terms of actual people utilizing these computers, do you have actual numbers as to show us as to how many people utilize these computers during that time period, say through Monday through Friday or Saturday through Sunday? So uh, I don't directly uh, supervise the public access computers. I supervise making sure that they're available, uh, that the systems are operational, but the day-to-day -day operations of those is handled by both the youth and teen services, and they have two separate areas, and then digital services, which has one area downstairs. And so they keep all those statistics. And we would be able to have access yes, to that absolutely. information? Typically, that those patron use um, numbers of use for the patron computers and some of the different devices um, are reported every month in the board packet. Um, so, you know, we can either go back to that or we can provide you however long you want. Okay. And then in terms of actually 200 computers on site, don't you feel that's a large number? It is a large number. I mean, due to the fact that everybody has computers and everybody has access to their own information, I think that's rather high. 
Well, uh, so that all 200 computers are available for every single uh, resident. Uh, we have computers that are re available to residents and patrons. And then we have computers for uh, library operations. So on the, uh, I could do a breakout and if we skip to the Capitals Project Plan, it's a, a, a nice re uh, reference resource here that can kind of really help answer your question. Um, other the replacement technology, this is 13 in the packet. Uh, this is 13 is the schedule, Technology Capital Project Plan. So on that first page, you can see, um, and this is just a very small amount of what technology equipment we have in the library. Uh, but you can see here, uh, staff PCs uh, constitute 80. So it's uh, about halfway down that first list, the first column. The patron PCs, we have 55 of them. We have Studio B laptops, which are uh, laptops that are able to be used both by the staff and for the patrons. So they're dual purpose as opposed to just having uh, a, a single place computer lab just for the patrons or just for the staff. Uh, we have them able to be shared amongst those two target groups. Um, and then we have uh, the public relations and IT workstation PCs. There is five of those total. And then you'll see through this list, uh, there's 11 patron laptops. And with those laptops, do we actually rent them out? In the building? In the building? Patrons for yeah. patrons to actually. Yes, and then during the pandemic, uh, the staff have been also utilizing them to do programming. And then how much do we charge for um, actually renting that? We do not charge. It's the same as if they sat down at a public access computer. Um, they just are able to take that either into a study room that does not have computers. Um, it, it, they can take it upstairs to the second floor or the third floor um, when either by themselves or in a group setting and do work. And As patrons, a, excuse me, I'm sorry, but sure. patrons are, are they able to rent them out then? I mean, take them home off site? No, they are not. Okay. Those uh, laptops stay in the building and they are not allowed to be removed from the building. And, and just a clarification we don't rent anything, we let here. We okay, let, some, we don't rent. St. Charles and all other libraries rent them out. It's up to them, but we do not hear. So in any way, uh, so those are like the core fleets. And then you can see that things such as like the subjects, uh, they run on computers. So there are additional purpose built workstations that either are being used by a staff person or directly by a resident, but not necessarily as a public access computer. So we have to, for some uh, reports, like the state IFWA reports, we have to take specific statistics um, so public use computers, for example, are those computers that you can set up a session, use the internet on. Um, we also provide access to, say, Microsoft Office and some other products. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Rich, I just have yes. one question. You mentioned um, Studio B laptops for both staff and patrons. That's correct. What's the quantity there? There is a total of 20 of those. There, okay, great. And then um, just for clarification, regarding your grant, which is um, affected by our outreach programs, if our outreach to um, school is done in the library, as opposed to at the school, does that count for fulfilling whatever the grant expects of you? I, I would not be able to answer that tonight. I would have to read the rules more closely because we haven't been in that type of situation. But what is your purpose in terms of outreach when it comes to that grant? What, what's the expectation that you do what for the schools? 
I'm not sure I understand. Well, I think Trustee Rosansky mentioned that your grant would be affected if we didn't go to the schools. Um, we don't intend to um, dissolve any outreach services. That wasn't the plan. But I'm just trying to figure out what the expectation is in order to qualify for this grant. Do we do we serve our student base here in the library as a school? Does that count or does that not count? Or what do you need to accomplish when you go to the school so that you're you're fulfilling whatever this grant requirement is? I'm happy to look at it. Okay, thank you. That that would be really helpful. And typically outreach means out of the building. Well, if you could look into that and let me know that would be great. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Yes, if we were to uh, increase um, instructions on computer use and, and operation, would your department be um, have enough manpower or, or whatever be able to uh, maybe give classes or some sort? So uh, there's two of us, but uh, typically we work 24 7, 365. And that's the job. So uh, yeah. I'm happy to put in whatever we need to do to, to build the business. Well, let's say there was a program, to, you know, for basic com computer skills or something. That's sort of... But yeah. That, yeah, Richard would not be handling that. Though. Sure. That would be the next department that's coming up, which is digital oh. services. So we would handle the back end, making sure those computers were operational and, and prepared and ready, uh, setting up the computers, um, actually holding the event or the program, the instructional program. Would be the digital services department. I have one question on uh, page 322. We have um, $4,000 worth of, you're requesting $4,000 worth of uh, low voltage wiring. Sure, I'm happy to move on to that. Um, and at this point, again. we're on staff licenses. Would you, would you like me to just skip ahead? Uh, to that particular part, or just continue on. Well, that's my particular question. You know, uh, that seems to me like that's like two miles away. Or... It's uh, actually, I believe, sixteen thousand feet. Well, that's three three miles away. Yeah, and it's a uh, 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 fifty cable runs. And do you replace that much wire in, in one year, or is that? Uh, so we all purchase or something. Sure. So uh, just to clarify, we're on uh, nine for and improvements. So we just skipped over the seven. Uh, so Thank we you. requested uh, four thousand dollars for uh, low voltage cable, uh, which is coupled with a grant of fourteen thousand two hundred eighty dollars. So a total of eighteen thousand two hundred eighty dollars to replace that uh, fifty uh, pairs of cable. Um, and so what we're uh, addressing is some of that cabling is back from 1997. Uh, it's Cat5 cabling. Uh, currently, the computers and some of the technology infrastructure that is utilizing that cabling uh, runs at faster speeds that Cat5 can support. Um, so upgrading that cabling or adding additional cabling to infrastructure devices for additional bandwidth is what this is for. Um, typically, we talk about things like the access points. So we have about 30 of those access points throughout the building in order to create a mesh and uh, provide full coverage for Wi-Fi devices. People bringing in computers, computers that the library has or devices that are using Wi-Fi, such as that laptop back there that is doing the Zoom and uh, Facebook live streaming today. And so the more of those devices come in, when we installed the uh, access points uh, for Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, we ran one cable to them, but they do support two cables. Um, so 30 of those is 30 cables to run 30 additional cables to them. Um, so it's about 30 uh, additional cables and then uh, 20 cables to, that are older cables to replace. We have several hundred cables in this building. Um, although we have, like I said, 200 devices roughly when it comes to computers, we do have devices, um, such as printers, uh, those access points, uh, remote switches uh, that power computers. Uh, the phones will be utilizing, the new phones will be utilizing uh, the same networking uh, cable. And so that's what, the, it's very strategic. It's not a blanket, oh, let's just replace it. This, um, this is part of a uh, package where you, you will get some 
uh, outside funding then. $14,280. If you purchase it, the uh, yeah. wire. So basically, this is this is probably enough wire to uh, re redo just about everything. I think this is enough to do 50 cables. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we have several hundred, we have probably just on the networking side, uh, over 500 cable runs mm -hmm. just to various locations. Perhaps they're not being used this particular minute or maybe even this year, but at some point someone wants to move something and then there's a data deck there. Um, when this building was redesigned and re renovated in uh, 2012, not every existing cable location was updated. Um, they either cut those lines and then abandoned them in place. If they could, they pulled them back. New lines were run to new areas, but some older wires were not. Uh, some places were cut uh, and then extended, and those extended cables, you might have a run that's, uh, I'm using my hands just to demonstrate, you know, if your run is 100 meters maximum and someone cut it at 70 to extend it because something, a wall was going in, that worked for that technology at that time. You need now put in an access point that requires more bandwidth, and then the either the equipment doesn't work or it works not efficiently. So it's losing packets and it's trying to make up for those lost packets because of that. So yeah, so this is a very strategic. We're not replacing all the cabling of the building. All right, I understand. Yeah. Robert, another question. In yes. regard to those 200 computers that you have on site, how many are allocated for employees versus resident um, residents? So again, back to that strategic plan, uh, as you see, uh, I have patrons and staff labeled by every single one of them. Um, so you can see like staff PCs was 80, uh, patron PCs was 55, uh, the patron studio new laptops, uh, their primary mission is to be for patron, patron programming. But they have a secondary purpose for the staff to be able to do staff programming as well um, or staff training. So we try to have dedicated computers, obviously, where they need to be, uh, and then multi purpose where we can. So there's also security concerns to be uh, to address by some of these things. You certainly can't have um, like those uh, com the computers that are the Studio B computers are very strictly locked down in order for the patrons to be able to use them, but also uh, on, on, and have the ability for the staff to utilize them and not be kind of um, shackled, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, getting back to uh, the schedules, uh, seven is for consultants. Um, again, we have uh, the first line is uh, uh, a part that grant. So, uh, in order to continually manage the infrastructure that we had purchased originally with the grants, uh, these namely the firewalls and the switches. Um, we are provided a grant of seven thousand eight hundred dollars, uh, which is uh, eighty percent of the cost, and then uh, we have five thousand dollars for uh, IT consultants. Just to that. Um, and then uh, there's two of us, and at some point, perhaps one of us does go and take some time off. It's rare, but it does happen. Uh, we do have um, an IT uh, network consultant emergency support. Uh, we do two and a half hours monthly. Uh, we have a program in which that doesn't get lost every month. Basically, it accumulates if you don't use it, so that we can then utilize that those hours uh, in additional support uh, whenever something arises, and would not have to pay extra for it. Um, and then uh, this year we were redesigning the, the website, so there, there's going to be probably some updates to. Uh, the content management system, improving developing it, and so we put in about three thousand dollars to that. So a total of twelve thousand five hundred. Questions? Um, I have a quick one. Yes. What is the total of this e rate grant again? Seven thousand eight hundred dollars for all these items, or just this particular one? This particular one under the notes section. Okay, so it's you have an e rate. Grant for each one of these, it's not a total amount, and then you just use, no, you apply uh, I have to apply specifically for a each particular one. service. Okay, right. advertise it, uh, have uh, a bidding opening for 28 days, sure. uh, 
collect all the bids that were or the or uh, submittal that were uh, sub submitted. Uh, make sure I evaluate it, go through a matrix, and then uh, award uh, those particular ones. Then request that to uh, the USAC, uh, the Universal Service Administrative uh, Company that administers the grants, and then we wait and wait and wait, and then we'll get approved. Uh, we'll get a, a, a letter indicating that uh, a decision letter. Uh, we've already gotten the decision letter, I believe, for the $9,000 of internet access. Um, so I have uh, in one of the schedules, it, it states what the breakout is for the e-grant per year. And you can see uh, the fiscal year, it says you know, $9,000 to be awarded that. Um, but yeah, it's very, very specific. So each, so every time I see e-rate grant, it's yes. for that specific item. Yes. Okay. And uh, for next year, the total comes out that we requested forty-eight thousand. Uh, okay. So next year are these items? Is that what you're That's what okay. And these have been already submitted, uh, and like I said, the internet uh, portion has been already awarded to us. And I anticipate perhaps August, late August, is when we might uh, hear on these particular ones. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks for that. Absolutely. Uh, eight office supplies, toner and color ink. Uh, this is based on the usage of uh, staff and patrons for toner and ink, uh, $8,500. Uh, I will tell you, um, this number used to be about $16,000, dollars um, but over the years, as technology has improved and we've upgraded, um, you know, we do two things. One, we try to maximize the length of the equipment that we have purchased. Um, and second, well, if, if we see that there's new equipment that is going to dramatically lower operation costs, we try to then budget to get that new equipment so that we can, on balance, save more money. So uh, the kind of the Nova copiers that we bought for the staff uh, to replace the older ones a number of years ago, lower this number by half. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's historically a lot of Thanks, we covered nine. I do have a question for yes. you. Oh, absolutely. I noticed the e rate grant here is 14000 but the cable is 4000 So that would make me think that you get a grant and then you apply other items to it. No, ma'am. So in nine, repairs and improvements, as Joe had asked earlier for us to skip uh, ahead, the total grant for the cabling is $14,280. Oh, and on top of that, we're paying $4,000 or 20%. So it's $18,280 to replace 50 cables, 30 new runs, 20 uh, uh, replacements. And that of that 18,000 total, uh, quote, 80% or $14,280 is what the grant has been requested for. And if we are awarded, as we have been in previous years, uh, then uh, the federal government will pay $14,280 and the library will pay $4,000 of that total $18,280 project. So then I'm misreading this. So the cable, the uh, voltage cabling does not cost $4,000 and the grant is $14,000. You're requesting 18, you, you have $18,000 worth of work to be done, yes, and you're requesting a grant for $14,000, and that's why it says tabling for $4,000. Right, because okay. that's I only the driver Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is, it's, believe me, um, every time uh, I'm working on it, both student and Greg come by, and I, How's the year I go? I'm like, well, here's an I update them exactly where we are on, on the process. And uh, it, it, it gets even worse on the back end when the vendor is going out or the service provider is going out and trying to get money directly from, uh, from the government. Uh, what we do is a method called um, SPI, which means that the service provider goes out and asks the federal government to get paid directly so that we only provide a check for the amount that we're supposed to cover. And sometimes it takes, you know, maybe a month or two for them to get the federal government to pay them. Even though we've said, yeah, they've done the service, we've paid them, everything is great. And, you know, they come to us and 
and I'll communicate for the federal government uh, company that is administrating this. And I say, hey, they've done everything. Please pay them. And so they'll, they'll, you know, this problem, that problem, we'll try to correct them, help the vendors and get paid. Like okay, just quickly, yeah, uh, something like that. Just, just quickly, the There's total of this project again was eighteen thousand. What was the total? Eighteen thousand two hundred eighty dollars. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And just a few more. I'm so sorry to take up all of this time. Oh, sure not. Uh, Ten non-capital expenses. Uh, technology equipment twenty-two thousand. This is uh, as the most indicates uh, used to purchase. Uh, one off, so a computer or a laptop, a scanner, perhaps a printer broke, uh, things like, for example, some of the microphones that you're speaking to tonight. Um, we've never had 11 microphones in this room, uh, so, but we, we were requested, so that's the budget that we use for that. Um, so bear in mind, we have, if you look at uh, the capital projects, um, we have a, a large fleet of non warranty computer technology. Um, so, this is a very small fraction of that. There's no questions on the bond. Eleven equipment maintenance. Uh, so you'll notice uh, some things here are not filled out because we're already within a, a support contract. Uh, we replaced our servers just before the pandemic, thankfully. Um, and there was work on site with multiple people and we were prevented from doing a lot of that um, because of the six feet distance that we needed to observe. Uh, so that's not in there. Uh, TBS annual maintenance, and this is for the paper print systems, the book scan stations, uh, Cash coin, credit card, uh, the software that runs the uh, booking reservation software. That's that. Um, and then maintain, replace uh, technology. This is the only budget we have for the general replacement of technology that breaks. So, uh, for example, one of the cables uh, that uh, is, is, is uh, powering Patty Rosansky's microphone, you notice it was broken. There was a short. So we use that fund, for example, to replace that game. Um, Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> so <laughs> we apologize. We, we caught it after the fact. I'm like, oh, you need to get that replaced. So got well, I don't think them. they get too much problem here. Me. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. So that, that is again that. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, 12 special reserve. Um, so the special reserve. Um, and 13, I can kind of handle at the same time, so we can <laughs> out of time here. Um, if you'll notice on 13 technology capital projects plan, the first column indicates the replacement technology equipment. It's basically a general description of what that equipment is. Um, and the third column is the fiscal year 2021 2022, which is reflected in. Uh, the Schedule 12 Special Reserve Equipment. Um, 27,000 is a, a forgive us, it's a, just a rounding number. That's at 26,667. That is the annual maintenance to, to support our automation technology. So that includes a lot of equipment, uh, namely uh, all the self checks that are in the building uh, that residents use to check out material. Uh, that is the uh, automated materials handling unit, which is what is. Uh, referenced by AMH, that is the return and sorter. So we have four of those, three available to the patrons. Thankfully, they're available again. Um, you know, I noticed that yesterday we were speaking about that. Um, so at uh, a point, we did have that door closed up and it was a manual return and we had to sort everything, keep it here, and then move it through the sorter. Uh, but luckily, that's all happening automatically again. Uh, RFID pads. So all our uh, materials have radio frequency identifier tags. In order to read that, uh, there are readers, and that's part of that service agreement. The security gates, a uh, the credit card, command center, these are all uh, part of those systems. And so uh, we've negotiated a five year uh, of which the first three years were committed to, and then uh, this will be our third year. 
Uh, we have to take a look, we will be taking a look at, uh, at this and see whether or not we're going to continue. Uh, if you notice that Biblioteca support agreement three plus two five year total on, on the schedule 13, uh, what does that, all these numbers mean for service here? Means that this year, this will be the ninth year that equipment has been running in the building. Uh, it's the third year of our support contract. So a year after that, it's going to be the 10th year of that equipment, fourth year of our support contract, that's an option. And then the 11th year is the fifth and final year that they would offer us support on that hardware. Um, and so at some point, we'll have to take a look. And uh, if you notice the last column, you'll see there's a $320,000 uh, placeholder for AMH, RFID gates, RFID pads, and warranty, uh, service year 11, obviously. Um, and that's roughly what we had paid. And by that time, we'll have you know information as to what our options are, to continue that type of technology at the library, uh, or have a whole presentation. Um, if we have to go out to bid, we'll go out to bid, all that stuff uh, will be in front of you. So we'll do a presentation as well. Um, but this is helps us plan how, uh, what kind of technology is coming up and what service years. And that's, that's an important part that I'd like to uh, make at this, uh, at this time. Maybe that would be my last point that I'd like to make. Um, is that that technology capital project plan, usually it's a five-year plan. Uh, it's the last you know, three years here. Uh, if you look at the service year column, it's very important to state, uh, I can't say this enough that you'll see numbers, you know, five, I think there's one five. Yeah, there's one five uh, access points. And those we actually all got 80% covered by the federal government. Everything else on here is seven, eight. Uh, thermal printers, 12 plus years. Uh, didn't even put the monitors in here, which are 10 to 12 years. So we try to utilize the technology as long as it's possible. Uh, a lot of times we come to the library board, maybe after seven or eight years for computers, because we can't install the latest OS. It just does not support that hardware anymore. Um, and so we're forced to do that. You know, we don't buy the super most expensive computers, but we buy computers that we know are going to last for a long time because we don't want to have to replace computers every three years and just put all that time and effort into it. And then it's all for not in three years. We want to invest, uh, you know, our time and the hardware to be able to last as long as possible and be effective in the market. So, so I just wanted to point that out. You know, are there any questions about any of uh, 13 or 12? And I think this is just a, a review of this page. Uh, yeah. All yeah. that stuff. Um, unless there's any other questions, I yield my time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Second department by the agenda is digital services. And digital services is supervised by Cindy Wolf. Can we start with number one? We do. Can we start with? I'm, never mind. I'll yeah. wait until you're sitting. You're just still passing stuff out. Number one. Okay. I was asking if you start with this page. Um. Well. We don't know. So the packet that I gave you guys was one. 
that uh, Trustee Derblett and Trustee McCoolin again wants to fill out. Um, we weren't fully really sure exactly how to do them, but we did our best um, and kind of a very short time frame. So they are program documents that she has asked that they have access to for today. Those are what we use to program. When I first started, we had desktop computers. 
you can allow us more lab flexibility. Now we have lab tabs, we set them up to get people such, situated in that capacity. Um, is there any questions I can answer about the programs in specifics? Are any of your programs online? Sorry, what? Are, are any of your pro programs, uh, uh, are you streaming any of them? Or any yes, of so as you can see from the worksheets that Mr. Sterling had, or just you know, has put together, we offered a number of online programs. I believe when I was calculating today, it was 156. I believe that we offered during the pandemic. You know, unfortunately, they're not marked, so I don't know if they're in person or online. So the, your, your forms that you had us create, they had a header on them and that said online. It said, Individual in person and individual online at the top header. We didn't mess with that. That was a different form, right? I'm looking at um, your program summaries and like NIPWITS doesn't say in person online. Right now, we just had our so first in person. I, th so this one says right. individual online comparables. It is a different be. form. So I guess I'll go through all of them and figure these, it out. Yeah, these are forms we just got it. Yeah, these yeah, were not checked where you had an option either in person or online. Yep, so it we can see noted. here it says Nitwits 33020. Um, their attendance was four. That was right at the beginning of the pandemic. I hope you give us some pause for that to understand that people weren't jumping online to knit right then. Um, but by you know 427, a month later, we had 11, we had uh, 13 people, yeah, you know, coming to that class. So that was online. So this is well, I'll go through all this and organize it and figure out what it looks like. I can speak to Netflix because I was part of it. Yes, there's 125 virtual programs to answer your question. Yeah. No. We, we did just have uh, five people today come in and organize stuff for Sunday. We were there for three hours. Yes. Plus two uh, visitors, young visitors that were doing work too. Yes, that are part of the group. Oh, yes. We had two student, two kids in there helping organize. Oh, for the networks and then Dharma. Yeah. Yes. Great event. Any other questions about the program? When were the forms provided to you? Um, Thursday morning of a holiday break. Right. Well, unfortunately, I had a holiday plans, so I couldn't work on this until Tuesday. Thank you for doing it. You're welcome. So long. So you still can't use that if I could do it, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're doing a question about programs, I'm happy to move on to materials. So again, kind of going back to this reference guide of the standards for Illinois public libraries. Um, libraries should offer new technologies, potential services, for example, social networking, maker spaces, and mobile apps. Um, as a result, we have a robust civilian technology collection exclusively for Niles cardholders. And this is in an effort to reduce the digital divide and raise the, raise the technology literacy impacts, which is kind of low. Um, while this is a small collection, it's really popular in our community. We average about 150 circulations a month. Um, we add collection items based on suggestions and community needs. Uh, the hotspots were a lifeline for our patrons during the COVID-19 crisis when the online room was closed. Um, they were, the patrons relied on this information to get health care information. I actually was able to publish a chapter in a book called Pivoting During the Pandemic all about our hotspot use. So hotspot lending during the pandemic, um, I spoke to our patrons who, you know, this one man was just like, this saved my life. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I couldn't come to the, to the library, use the computer. You know, there's been this idea that everybody has access to technology. We see the same folks in every day. Not everybody has a computer at home. Not everybody has broadband. You know, there is a real, and we saw that in this crisis, right? We saw that people were really left behind. And so the services that we provide may seem frivolous, or not that important, but for some folks, this is this is really an important service. Um, the Creative Studio Makerspace, 
provides a range of equipment to modern fabrication, 3D design, fiber, sales, and more. Um, Mr. Makula, or Trustee Makula, had made a note that we should charge patrons for materials needed for maker items. Uh, would, you, would you? And I, I know you took a couple of tours. I wish I were there. Yeah, they thought I've been bored in the maker space. Yeah, because I've been charged. Yeah. It's on the big board in the makerspace with all the things. And then the other handout I gave you has the price list. Um, we've been charging for 3D prints since we started. Mm -hmm. 10 cents a gram. So yeah. after we print the item, we weigh it on a little like weight watcher scale. And then we, you know, move it up from point, we add a bill to their record. Um, and that covers the cost of the filament and staff time. It's also been a great way to offer the service to maybe people who are outside the Niles Library. Um, we are getting people who submit jobs for us to use. So it is a great service. Um, and it was well worth what I paid for the item I had paid for. Yeah. So some, can I ask you a question? In sure. terms of actual usage for the 3D printer, um, how many people a month do you actually have utilizing that actual machine? So it is reported in the board packet every month. Um, it ranges between 30 and 55 or like 70. Prints per month. And do you have record of that? Yep, we have a spreadsheet. We have record. It is also noted in the board packet every month, um, but we do keep record of that. And then we keep record of how much they're charged. It's really more of a procedural thing. You know, when you start a job, it can be 10 hours or five hours. So you need to let the next person know. So we have a spreadsheet where we put the name, the card number. They need a card number so we can bill them. How long it's going to take this printing, if it's been billed, if the patient's been contacted, there's a lot of steps. How many uh, digital printers do you have? Uh, we have two. Two? Mm -hmm. We have one that is our workhorse, it's a Prusa. And we have another one, a Volkswagen Mini, and that we do take out. We have been a part of the fire department's open house for three years. Uh, we take it to their uh, kind of community events, the block party at the village. And we um, are able to print remotely like that. So that's kind of a nice thing. I, the reason I asked, I saw one that I thought was broken upstairs. Upstairs? I mean, there's there's one here on the steps that yeah. doesn't need a part. And then there's one downstairs in the maker space. There's two printers. Not, the one that was not not in the maker space. I think they were having problems. There's one in a glass box at the top of this landing. I'm not sure. No, it was in, a, in an office room. It was being worked on or something that they tried a lot. Yeah, so it was disposed of. That was something that was purchased in 2015, I believe. It oh. was at end of life. Baker Bot no longer supports it. I filled out a request for okay. deaccession. So that was going to be disposed of then? It has already been disposed okay. of in accordance with the rules. Are there any questions I can ask, answer about the technology piece? I've personally been in the uh, studio to me or whatever you call it down there. I don't, I keep screwing up the name and I have used many of the pieces of equipment. I have used the knitting machine and so on. And I have seen other people who have used it and I've had other people come up to me and tell me how much they appreciate the library as them. Thank you. Trustee McCool, if I could just ask you to clarify, you have made a note that if patrons can purchase out loaned items readily on the market, then the library will not get involved in lending of these items. So am I to take it that you I was looking at the, uh, at the cameras, the expensive cameras that we were, were renting out. You could buy those at uh, Best Buy or you know, various other places. And if we were to offer those, I mean, if everybody that wanted one showed up here, we don't have 500 or 200. I, I, what do you have, like three of them or something like that? Um, I only have one. One. So I mean, it is, it's, you know. So I checked that camera to... out last week, Joe, to use it for the Culver A3 dance. So that's a good use of it, just to give you an example. The people have been checking it out for specific things. I had a woman who was on a vacation. We have a smaller little cannon, and she wanted to take it. She said, I came here last time. A lot of people are just using it for very specific 
Um, well, if, if they take an application, it might be gone for 10 days. So it's a one week checkout period. They know that. So, you know, we do. But it's not available. I mean, well, then we need to get more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, with all due respect, you know, we're a library. You can purchase the book from right. Amazon, right? Like, right. what we're doing is we're lending items. We're, we're providing the community. And I've had people return them and say, I'm going to go buy it myself, to your point. Right now, I'm running a program with age options, fully grant funded, to circulate tablets and hotspots to seniors. Half of those seniors are saying they want to see if they want to buy it themselves. And they don't feel comfortable going to Target and just using it for four minutes on one of those things. They get to take it home and see how they like it. And so that is part of the part of our role, but also it's like Patty said, we have a knitting machine. It's a very specific thing or a camera. You might only use it once or twice. So it's better to have a library and have a community provide it. And then it has it's accessible to all. Well, if to be accessible for all, they probably should stay in the library and not go on for 10 days. Well, if you can't the light camera in the library, how would someone want to take pictures outside the library? People could examine it and you know the they can use it in the library and see how it works. Can I speak now, please? Um, so I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm the Library Director for the Library. I understand what you're saying. However, thinking back to how many times Carolyn has reminded us that we are in pandemic and we have a lot of people who are out of work to expect them to go and spend money when they're more concerned with paying their rent and their food is kind of ridiculous. Thank you. Susan, I have a question. What camera are you speaking of? So we have a selection of GoPro cameras. Um, we also have cameras, the DSLR. So how many GoPros do you have? Um, I believe we have five. Five GoPros. Okay. Um, they are very popular. You know, you had a gentleman at Public Commons saying that he appreciates the use of this. I mean, this is something the community values. And I would, I guess that's kind of what I'm looking for some direction from you guys. If you don't want me to lend equipment, which we've been doing for five years, is there something you else you would like me to focus on? Well, typically these, these items start out at Four thousand dollars. Let's say I'm, I'm not sure what you paid for. Let's say two thousand. That thing is more than the highest item is probably two hundred dollars. Oh, okay. And I have and, been and, speaking and, about this for years, yeah. and I do encourage libraries not to purchase anything that's that incredibly expensive. Okay. Usually, the price comes down considerably, and uh, electronic stuff, you know, over time. So uh, the thing I see the problem is that we have fifty-eight thousand people in the district. And we have a limited number of these things available, and how do you, how do you ration out who gets it, and especially if it's gone for quite a while, uh, you know, rent out for vacations or loan out for vacations, it's gone, three people can take it, and it's, it's gone for a whole month. So I, I don't understand, though. Are you saying that you think we shouldn't buy them at all? Or are you saying you think well, we should buy three times? I don't think we're in a position to buy all that there's a demand for. So should we be in it at all? That's what I'm saying. I don't know. Well, that's my only observation from the board. I would think that maybe this is something we want to do. Obviously, there's a community yeah. need. So if you don't want me to do what I'm doing, well, then I, I if just, you could give me a direction that would be helpful so I can, you know, organize my time and figure out what I'm doing. The, the problem I see is that if it's if it's three people borrow this thing in one month and, and there's Maybe a demand for a hundred people that want it. I don't think we should go out and buy a whole bunch of these things, but maybe it shouldn't be taken out for 10 days or 12 days or something like that. The loan period is in the policy, the lending policy. It is one week loan period. The only thing that goes out for three weeks are mobile hotspots. Mm -hmm. So it is a lending policy that the board set. I, I do not control that. I, I was more. Well, we can reconsider well, that. That's part of the problem, Joe. You're making these accusations without knowing the truth. I think maybe a better policy on something like this might be two or three days. Might be what? Two or three days. And if that's how the board feels, then you guys can that's how Joe feels. And if you want to change the lending policy, that would govern what I do. That's why I'm looking to you. Right. What would you like me to do? I mean, let's change an example. You not want we want you to do what you're doing right now. This is ridiculous that we're talking about <laughs> lending policies at this time. 
This is the this is the budget time. time. Let's about. worry about okay. getting the facts about the budget. Right. Right. It's not how she needs talk to about change this her at all. department. It's supposed Suzanne to be handled by the library staff, not by the board of trustees. Yep. Right. I'm just waiting for her to finish. Okay, um, Suzanne, these are uh, budget workshops. We're here to hear your concerns and your questions and get your input. Of course, we will be reviewing all of this information before the June 14th budget meeting. And that's when we'll figure out what we think is the best way to go. And okay. we'll just responding have... to the comments on my budget. So I didn't... No, absolutely. And I want you to. That was the purpose of sharing those comments with you is because you know, maybe Joe is new on the board and he has ideas and maybe they're not the greatest ideas, but you know, we need to talk about it. And as far as policy being a factor, if it is, then maybe we need to consider it even though it is budget time. You and know, maybe we need to, make we need sure to everything consider works dealing here. with the budget now, please. We can move on to staffing. There's no more questions about Thank the materials. You. I have a question that's not on you, Susie. I'm wondering, Carolyn, if you have any, you just mentioned that we're gonna be able to review the materials before the 14th. Is that something that we're going to be doing together or individually? Well, we have all the materials ourselves. So I, I haven't had time to go through all of these um, documents from even yesterday's departments. So I would like to go through them and understand more clearly. So are we going to have a chance to come together as a board again before the 14th to discuss what we're well, doing? Well, the 14th is our budget meeting, so we can definitely discuss it that day. But that's not what I'm asking. I, I didn't intend to meet again. No, I plan to absorb all this information and on the 14th we would have our budget meeting and discuss it. I feel it would be very worthy for the for the board to sit down together and have a meeting before that. I don't know if anyone else feels the same way. Well, I think three workshops is sufficient for us to ask any questions now, especially with the staff here. That was right. the purpose. Right, I understand that. I'm saying that board specifically. As a board, our board meeting for the budget is scheduled for June 14th. That's been so. What I'm meeting. asking, Carolyn, is for us to have another meeting as a board before the 14th. That's what I'm proposing. I don't know if I could actually meet that. Well, I can't meet on the 14th, but that wasn't really put into your plan. So you can't meet on the 14th. I stated that on, at the last meeting. Yes. yes. Just like she said, she would have a problem. You cannot meeting. make the June 14th. No, I cannot. Meeting. I said I will be out of town. Oh, I thought you were going to be out of town for these three no, meetings. No, she was working. Well, I'm sorry. There's so much confusion when we have meetings. It's hard to tell. But I didn't realize you were not available on June 4th. That is correct. Which is an important meeting. Yes, that's, that's yeah. correct. That's why I'm asking to have a chance to for us to discuss this before that, because I won't be here, which I did make clear at the last meeting. I'm sorry. I didn't hear it. We have, again, we have a lot of chaos in our meetings. I apologize. But that's something we need to reconsider then. Thank you because that is an important meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, my apologies, I didn't hear it. But again, if we all speak at the same time, believe me, I don't hear everything. All right, I'm sorry, Suzanne, please continue. Suzanne, may I just ask question? you one question? Sure. In terms of actual usage of like your cameras and so forth, and they're off site, and say someone loses an item or, or, or something is broken, how does that work? Who is liable for that? And where do we begin or yeah. how does that work? That's a great question. I have been, you know, presenting on, I was one of the people who started leading this movement of London technology. And so I would go and speak at workshops and people would say, well, aren't you scared? You're not going to get these items back. What do you do? And I said, well, what do we do with folks, right? It's the same process. We send them letters of notice. We send them things. What I found the most effective way is to call them and say, hey, do you know you still have this item out? Sure, there have been things that haven't been returned. We follow the same protocol as we would. Um, hotspots are really cool because you can turn them off. You can turn off the service to them and it basically become like a little work and they come back the next day. Usually it's a very, very effective of getting it back. Um, so, you know, I would say i am honestly been very happy in the last five years of not having that much stuff or loss. Sometimes things that go missing at a certain point are kind of on their way out. Like a GoPro 3, we don't circulate anymore until they go on this model, we're up to a 9. So we want to provide our patients with some newer technology. Um, but we would follow the same thing. We would send them to collections and they did not come back. And they, they would have, you know, a bill on their record and not be able to use the library. But I would say we are pretty fortunate. It's not like two have not really experienced much loss. And part of that, just to jump up, it is not as hard as we're You know, there are community members. So it's been really kind of cool to limit this collection. I mean, it does cause 
you know, some other people from other areas. But this is a specialized collection just for Niles Harbor. not lending it to anybody else. And we do stay very firm on that policy. Thank you. Um, staffing. So um, when we return to 70 hours of standard operation, we anticipate computer use to be increased back to pre-pandemic usage. Um, this question was asked when which was speaking. We average about almost 6,000 monthly computer users, many of them who are technology challenged or need assistance navigating technology. Um, there was an average monthly print of 225,000 prints. And those are like pieces of printing papers and then 5,300 uh, 5, scans. And so that's by the scan and fax station. Um, the digital services staff facilitate many of these transactions. They're both highly trained and incredibly patient to offer top bench service to our patients that are struggling with technology. Uh, the digital service, digital services staff are an invaluable resource to the community, and they receive high praise for the work that they do. On the other side of that sheet, I pointed out were some comments that we get um, that had that price list on it. You know, my department, I want to say, I'm really proud of. They get a lot of positive comments, and I think it's because the work that we do is so impactful. You know, you get somebody coming down, and they need to get their taxes filed, but they need to get this to a lawyer, and they're upset and they're frazzled, and we work with that. We, you know, okay, what do we need to do? How do we need to do you have your email password? You know, that was my favorite question to start with. So um, the work that we do is incredibly meaningful. Um, I think a lot of folks feel very intimidated and, and I think it's an incredibly eye-opening work to do to see young folks who may have only had a mobile phone trying to navigate the actual computer. Um, and the technology literacy and the digital divide is real. And, we deal with it every day and we're really, it's a very intense place to work. I would say not everybody, well, you know, it's, 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 a, there's an energy now. And I think it's great. And my, the digital services team is, is time magic. I cannot be happier with them. Um, on our employee roster, I did want to call your attention. Um, one of the, we are actually, the, uh, Trustee McCoola and Plus Trustee Derwick had eliminated the vacant 15 hour week position. Um, that had actually been filled before this hiring freeze went into place, um, but we are actually down a 30 hour a week digital services IT assistant. Um, the IT assistants are really critical. They complement Rich's work, Rich and Greg's work in the IT department. Uh, we typically have them scheduled to cover you know, on evenings and weekends so that Rich and Greg could be off if there was an emergency. They're, they're here kind of responding to things. Um, so I would, I would advocate that we do need those 30 hours um, position back. I'm sorry, there was a 30 hour position of vacant. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it just was not up to date on this. Um, we can give you an updated form. And then folks are under IT, not you, correct? No, this is digital services. As you can see, um, there are two positions, digital services, IT assistance. Okay. Uh, one of those um, people is no longer working at the Okay. Yeah, we made a change uh, back when we started digital services, where the IT department had handled the network and, um, and, and all the staff prop issues. And so we wanted to have IT assistants who could help both staff and patrons with their minor or their lower level things and have our highly trained IT personnel handling the network and things like that. So the uh, digital services IT assistants do most of the helping out of um, uh, software and hardware problems for both staff and for patrons. Respond to that. We do that annoying thing. Try turning it on and off again. That's the first line of defense. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. But I hate when they use it on me. So. <laughs> yeah. um, I do want to say, you know, during the pandemic, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but we were the first department to open back up. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a special entrance um, on the open side of the building. There's some stairs down there. And we allowed people to come in and use the computers before the building was open to the public. Um, we took appointments, it was now as card holders only, and it was very utilized. Um, the demand been there. Yeah. Yeah, people 
April. So we did that Wednesday in June and then again during the during the last shutdown for two different times. And so I think that just gives you a sense that this is a critical department, you know, and, and access to some of these resources, people really is their only one. Uh, can I just ask why the next to Lisa Hale the next is highlighted? Any particular reason or why there's what? Uh, the 19 food networks is highlighted. Um or? it was increased. Oh okay. Thank you. She was at 15 and then she was not allowed to. So she was increased by four hours? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thank you. She's still considered part-time though at night too. She is. And uh, that actually is, she is a paper space assistant. She's not in digital services. She um, came to us with a really extensive background in sewing and fiber arts and she can do many things. Yeah, I've dealt with her. She's fantastic. So we just felt that it's that you will have to be correct. So we can correct that the snow at the bottom. Two people eliminated the position in the process. I don't think it's still up for discussion. They were written in my result. Only was it one or two that event? So the 15 hours has been filled. Um, the 30, now we are down to 30 hours for IT positions. Okay. So 30 hours that we are currently, as I think, we have 40 percent in mind. Um, we've been asked by candidates for that flat. Like I said, having coverage at the desk is really crucial. And they would come in as part timers. Yeah. yeah. So we're not paying anything like insurance or any of that stuff. So yes, you are. The 30 hours. 30 hours. Yes, you get IMRF and insurance. If they're part time, I'm thinking. Part -time oh, okay. If they're part time, let me explain. They're like part time is like 19 hours or less. No, over 19 hours. Okay. That's, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Development. Um, according to the standards for Illinois Public Libraries, the library supports and encourages staff to learn new skills, current with new developments in public libraries, and gain their enthusiasm for library work. Um, attendance at local, regional, state, national conferences, relevant courses, workshops, seminars, and other library related meetings provide a variety of learning experiences. Um, and I would say for myself, conferences have been incredibly invaluable way for me to learn about new ideas and stay current on library trends. Um, you, digital services is a department that focuses on technology and if according to just Jermalik and Justin Makula, they have zeroed out and provided no professional development for my team in this upcoming fiscal year. And that would be very detrimental to us. We wouldn't be able to learn new things. We wouldn't be able to, you know, what we do is really specific. And we would not be able to learn about the latest things. And so I think that would be really unfortunate. Um, there is a value to speaking on conferences and attending the Public Library Association conference that's coming up in Portland. I have spoken at the last week. I was um, at Stanley 2020. I did a digital literacy tools for teaching. Um, I presented at ALA conferences. Um, you know, top tech trends, tech to go, circulating to not traditional items. Um, these are really important places to be, and it's really discouraging to see that that has not been, um, you know, that that has not been valued in, in here. Um, the ALA Code of Ethics states that we strive for excellence in the profession by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills, by encouraging the professional development of coworkers, by fostering the aspiration of potential members for the profession. So a knowledgeable staff is really critical to having a modern and innovative library. And I heard that just you heard last night talk about how you want to raise the value of this library. That's how we do it. You know, we go out and we we find ways to um, grow and do better and really improve ourselves. And so, you know, in addition to learning from our library community, and I think you guys all have valuable experience, but 
it really does help to learn from like we're professionals. You know, just you can say if you're a nurse, like you want to learn from other nurses of what's going on, you know. I mean, if there is value in hearing from the community, but there's really value in hearing from our own profession and what we you know hold to be true. And then in addition from learning from the professional library community, it, it's crucial to be part of our actual community. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is a valuable partnership for the library and it provides us as an active community member. Um, I currently serve on the executive board of the Chamber of Commerce as a second vice president. Um, and in pre-pandemic times, we hosted a monthly business networking event here at the library. Once a month, brought the business community in, and so many of these folks have never been here before. So to your point, Trustee Durbin, like last night, you're bringing people into the library, cutting out which bringing people in. That's what I was doing. The partner with the chamber, once a month, 40 people in this meeting room, for breakfast, across the library, nothing. And I had so many people say to me, I've never been here before. And hopefully they came back, because I know those breakfasts are like 7.30 in the morning. So um, the point is, yes, we want we want people here at the library, but we want to bring them here during operations because we want to showcase this place and we want people to come back. For some reason, our library isn't as, as well used as it should be, and it should be one of the most popular sites in our community. So I agree with wanting everyone to come to our library, but we want them to utilize it as well. Well, and I think there were a lot of people that came to the library and saw the resources that we offered. I would give tours of the studio, and they say, oh, let me, let me record a commercial for my business. Or um, State Farm was here and said, this is a great space. Let me pay you. Absolutely. We could use we could use so, corporate donations, without a doubt, to support a lot more programs that we'd be able to provide for our residents. Great idea. Absolutely. And I think the chamber is a valuable place to be. Um, you know, Joe, Trustee Makula, you had said yesterday that they should give us equity membership. And I would like to point out that these are all the organizations in Niles that currently pay. Niles Family Fitness, Niles Family Service, Niles Teen Center, Niles Fire Department, Niles Historical Cultural Center, Niles Police Department, Niles Public Works, Niles Senior Center, and Niles Township High School District 219. So I'm not understanding why we would think that we're exempt from paying a chamber membership too, but all of these other organizations pay. In my opinion, they should give us the benefit of membership without charging us. It's a business organization. The membership is only $175. You can knock down to a nonprofit status. Right. I think it's a worthwhile thing. Events such as leadership lunch and night of roses. They've been really important to the library, especially Dirk, like I've been with you at that event. And you know, I think they're really Has this generated any major donations to the library? You're talking about State Farm giving a lot of money to the library or something. It is is the Chamber of Commerce, the connections there brought a lot of contributions to the library of any significance. They have our community connections are not about getting money for the library, they're about providing services to the community, not the other way around. Well, they did. They, we should they should reciprocate. We do a great many things, and they need an organization. And I think we need to just see what in fact they can do for us. Well, and I think so. that's a great point. And I have been meeting to explore those avenues of you know I'm on the executive committee with somebody from Shore. As you're looking around in the microphones, there's all Shore microphones. You know, is there some way that we can partner with them to get donations of that size? Well, these, are things, these are ideas that I have, but I can't continue this work, Trustee Mahula, if I'm not on this committee. And part of the other thing I do is getting people in. You know, we have these amazing business resources and things, and we're going to have, you know, in this post-pandemic world, we're going to have businesses that need to figure out who's in their who's in their district and, you know, cold calling what businesses are considered. We have those resources for them. So we do have businesses that support the library. Is that what you're saying? We have businesses that use our that use our resources, yes. Well, absolutely, but I'm saying reciprocate. We we need we need these great com companies and these great organizations to, to help support the library. And many other library districts, corporations fund their library programs one hundred percent. And I'd like to see I, us no, be able to do that. And they, they, they are taxpayers. The businesses yeah. of Niles are taxpayers. I'm sure they are. But again, on another note, in other areas, 
corporations willingly fund programs at libraries. They'll cover an entire computer program. But we have so, to ask, and then you exactly. know, you can, you can work to form a foundation that was trying to get requests like that. But that's but the point is that they that you start. Suzanne has said all this work to build these relationships that now we could potentially build on. I don't think it would be. I think it would be very short sighted to pull one hundred seventy five dollars and lose the connections, you know, that she has built through this. It's been long methodical work, and it's been very reciprocal. And well, the reciprocal I'm not seeing. I'd like to see that. Well, they initiated. Well, I'd be happy to explore some avenues. I really would. Um, but again, I can't do that if I'm not on the chamber. Because if we don't, if you don't renew the chamber membership, I can't continue to serve on you. I will be effectively done and have no communication with these people because I don't have, you know, we do the fire department open house. That brought in people to our library because they said, oh, this is really awesome that you have this technology. We'd love to come back. It shows us in a really positive light. Um, Could we even approach the chamber and see what they'd be willing to do with to help us and that in, in either allowing us not to have to pay the membership or what can they do for us? I mean, I, I've been to many chamber events and this library puts on top notch accommodations for them in, in a million different ways. And I think that's impressive for us. But again, there are these businesses are corporations generating money. We don't. We have an amount of money that we get from the taxpayers and we do the best we can to serve the community. I'm saying these businesses benefit from this library because you had your green space and I don't know, a million other things, taking photos at different events. I mean, we do a lot for them. I'm just saying, gee, maybe we could for you could forego our membership compared to the hours our staff spend supporting their events. You know, maybe that's a question we could ask. Well, and I think if you, I would encourage you to think of it in a different way. That the Chamber of Commerce, their business too, right? They've been hard hit with the pandemic because a lot of people have renewed their chamber dues and haven't been able to contribute that. I think if you want to focus more on the business side, I'd be happy to start. You know, if I got some more tangibles, we would like program sponsors, we'd like donations of equipment. I could go down those avenues, but I think going after the chamber and saying, you know, they can't make their ends meet if, if they gave a free membership to everybody. Like they're just facilitating this and they are trying to bring it to the community, but they are fully funded on these, you know, chamber dues, on the business dues. And so uh, I just ask you to consider it. You know, I think it's a really important it's organization. Not, uh, it's not one hundred seventy-five dollars. It's about two thousand dollars of taxpayer money that's going to the chamber and the, and the roses and the um, events and et cetera, et cetera. When you total it up, all the various departments of participation. So okay. it's it's a lot more than that, and I I don't see the benefit we're we're going to be getting out of it. I, I think they should let all the government agencies that they want to have come over there. I don't know why. You need six six agencies from the village, the fire department, the police department, the fitness center. Are they all I mean, yeah, I know, but, but, they, yeah, but they, they have a, a, a revenue coming in about 10 times more than we do. So I mean, maybe they can afford it. How much did we pay? What is our membership do? $175. So where's when the Joe, is, how, when when Joe is talking so about the events, the, we go to events. the events they pay to, the roses, the advertising and the book, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to be part of the community or not? You want us to be just I, an isolated I think they building give it to us with free. no. You do you think we're going to keep qualified people in this building the way you are thinking of treating them? You think that the community? You think that the Chamber of Commerce is going to do anything for you if you go to them and say, "Hey, I am not going to be part of you." Wait a minute. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Joe, I feel we should very seriously consider paying the $175. I, as a board member, have no problem paying my own fee. I will give up the, having the library pay my fee to go to anything I choose to go to. Does that? And if the rest of us agree, would you then allow the $175 so she can I, sit there and possibly work the for It involves all the uh, events, the, the uh, dinners, and the. I said, I, as a board member, and if the rest of us all agree to pay our own fee in our own way, 
would you consider letting her be a member for $175? Well, I would have been, are you I would, I would have been, yes. it's, not, it's not me, it's the library. It's the library, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's I, just I, you're a, an officer and then we'll yeah, take yes. it away. If we just pay the 175 and everybody uh, paid their fee for any event they're going to, that's fine. I personally have no problem with that. I don't I, know if the rest of you do. do. I have no I problem do. with that. Okay, Penny um, Pinter. Can we? Can we so, I, unless anybody has another question, no, about please. The last please subscriptions. Um, so, our professional organizations are really important to us. Um, I currently serve on the PLA Digital Literacy Committee, whose mission is to help libraries meet community needs related to digital literacy and the use of technology to collect and disseminate information on digital literacy resources, tools, and strategies, which might be applied to public library operations. Um, the, the work I do on that committee is valuable and it's nationwide. I have um, some of the things that have come out of that have been really helpful and useful on, on, a, on a national scale. And I would be very disappointed if I could no longer be a part of that committee because my PLA membership has been removed. So that's all I have. Thank you, Andrew. Lucy, I think all the work that you've done professionally is wonderful. Congratulations. And I very much enjoy your department. Thank you. It's a fun department. It definitely is. And the people there are top notch. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your time. Thank you as well. How many trees have been lost for the case during the winter? <laughs> these, these are. Thank you for that. <laughs> Comparable pace 
during the pandemic compared to a not pandemic year. The chart at uh, budget page 294 further illustrates the comparison um, of the last nine months beginning March of 2021 when the budget was created, in comparison to the same months as the year prior. Showed an increase of the six months for additions and all nine months for withdrawals. And the circulation has increased 56% since January of 2020. Uh, since January of 2021. A question came up about the staffing levels uh, being tied directly just to material. And even if the materials budget um, is remaining steady for the upcoming fiscal year, our staff level is appropriate for this materials budget, as illustrated by the number of subject comparisons above. However, the new materials do not represent the entire scope and the extent of our work on material services department. Some of the other areas that um, fill our work are uh, one of the things that we're working on is an inventory. The material services department provides an inventory process for the library's entire collection. The inventory provides a reconciling of the catalog, the holdings, and what is actually on the shelf. This helps to vet damage, missing, and correctly shelf material. It is important for patrons and staff that the material is correct in the correct location and accessible for use. We began the current inventory process in November of 2019. We are 30% complete and will require approximately 500 more hours to finish the entire collection. Once baseline is established, we will continue the holding inventory to support the catalog work completed. The entire material services department is contributing to this project. We also do reclassification. For example, sometimes a collection and how it's organized in the past makes sense then, but then over time, terms might change. A collection might be developed and a reorganization would make sense um, for make it easier for the patrons to find. Say, for example, um, when RAP first started coming out, it was classified under um, R&D and sold. As it's more prevalent and more people were looking for RAP, they wouldn't intuitively look in R&D and sold anymore. So it was broken out into um, its own. Um, classification area of RAM. So that's one example of what a reclass would do. Withdrawals are another area. Um, the item records uh, are removed from the catalog by the material services department based on meeting decisions made by the selectors and the youth services and adult services department. Many withdrawn items after being processed through our department are evaluated by volunteers and they are um, placed in the continuous book sale to generate revenue. Um, for the library. We do disk evaluation. Our staff uses an industrial machine to uh, repair DVDs, Blu-ray CDs, and video games. Evaluating these items extends the life of these materials and provides patients with a quality use experience. We also do repairs. Um, we do things such as damaged liner notes, cases, jackets, label replacement, broken spines, and binding. Outsourcing of binary funds became prohibitively expensive, including shipping, so we folded these repairs back into our department. We also run reports. We create reports and work with CCS to automate these reports. Selector requested reports can illustrate how patrons use and interact with the parts of the collection. This data helps selectors make decisions for their area. Also, reports can show when items last circulated and other data as requested. This um, helps inform decisions for weekly and items and considering other items that might benefit for reclassification or a special display and bolster potential circulation. For some areas like travel or walk, uh, we can run reports that select things from a certain date on. So that way we are um, that the selectors can use that to make sure these items are current. So we're not having outdated travel books, outdated law books. Um, we uh, work um, in the with consortial collaboration. There's 20, 27 libraries in the CCS consortium. It allows us to work collaboratively in a um, provide cost effective, high quality, 
and future focused library technology solutions to members that provide resource sharing, facilitate knowledge sharing, and improve patron experience. It's the responsibility of the catalogers and our department to integrate digital, physical and digital materials where possible and incorporate innovation in the library field to this end. We develop methods to provide a complete search and find um, a complete search and find experience for our patrons. Um, Jamie, uh, the assistant department head and my and lead cataloger myself, continue to serve as members and officers on CCS technical groups, including um, standard catalog rules practices and um, the cataloging technical group and the acquisitions group. And people in our department participate in um, sharing our knowledge within these groups as well. Um, so that brings us to um, you know, conclusion on, on staffing. So that, in addition to everything we do with materials, these are other things that we do, um, which justifies our staffing levels. Uh, do you guys have any specific questions about um, the structure of the staff? I would just like to say uh, thank you because apparently I had no, not the knowledge I thought I had. Before. <laughs> and that's a stretch of the service. Those are some duties outside of what's related specifically to materials. Mm -hmm. that's, oh, but that was the question that was asked. And, um, Outside of things that were dependent on a new internet material for the department. Did it give you any questions on that? I will continue. Sure. I'm going to move to number four for professional development. Um, so, Judy had read about the, uh, the standards you know, for Illinois public libraries and the library supports and encourages staff to acquire new skills through current with the developments in public areas, renew their enthusiasm for work events at local, regional, state, and national conferences, relevant courses, workshops, seminars, and in service trainings, and other library related meetings provide a variety of work experiences. To serve our patients effectively, we must maintain and enhance our knowledge and skills. Practices and standards evolve particularly with something as specialized as cataloging. It's comparable to staying current with computer coding, medical terminology. Catalogers need to remain current and support a catalog that provides complete search and find experiences for our patrons. So if you guys look at the, the papers that I gave you, those are just two examples of uh, bibliographic records that were created by our department. One is the bibliographic record for Russian poetry, um, so in that language, and the other one is for um, the animated blue gray wall. So you can see all of the details that goes into those records, so we can find um, that. Um, member subscriptions. Um, a membership to a professional organization is critical in connecting with colleagues in libraries across the country and sometimes the world. It provides us with additional tools to stay current on practices and standards in our profession and an opportunity to share our acquired expertise to benefit the library community. Resources like the music OCLC user group and online audio visuals catalog, the online audio visuals, audio visual catalogers group that is part of ALA provides sources and tools that are not easily accessible, sometimes even available staff anywhere else. So those were five areas that I have covered in the tech services department. Oh, no, sorry. That was the service services department. Yeah. We changed our name. That's right. I've been there for 28 years. So it's just been a couple <laughs> of months. It's a little, it's a little hard to uh, make that adjustments. Do you guys have any questions? Come up with anything else based on our structure. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate that all of you want to continue your professional learning, and I love that, and I I feel bad that you have to fight for that. I mean, I think it's really important too when you bring this much time and expertise to what you've been doing for years. Um, 
that it's really good to share with people who are just beginning this process and keep them enthusiastic and excited and keep building.
so that people didn't trip or were less likely to trip, we've been able to bring the rates down as they've aged off of our history. So, you know, it's not only, you know, keeping the floor clean, it's helping to, uh, you know, arrest uh, any increases in our insurance costs when we have a problem so that our employees are safe. Uh, and, you know, we have better cost structures as well. So, so uh, it helps us in the wintertime because they throw all the salt and all the stuff that's in the lot, right? They dry it in the library, of course, you're going to soil our carpeting. And now we replace that. I think we've gone in probably 10 years or better uh, cycle that we, we've not replaced the carpet. Which is huge. Which is good. I mean, that's that point. We try to keep it clean. We do. Uh, I usually have a, a quarter. I try to get the carpets clean. And here, when we have programs, I try to clean this carpet in here at least on a quarter to make sure that spills and things because kids are in here, you know, things go on. We try to keep this carpet in here as clean as we can. This, and the rest of the library is the same way. It's always, you know, we try to maintain it as best we can. We don't want to replace carpeting if we can avoid it because it's costly because it's a room of this side here. So we have to keep so try, to, try to maintain it as best we can. And then the last one on the list is the um, fire extinguishers. We've got 27 fire extinguishers in the building. Each one has a uh, station in the library, and a couple of them on there are specific for. Rich's department because they do handle um, uh, his electronics and stuff like that, so we don't damage his electronics any more than we have to. The rest of it is regular uh, powder. Uh, so those have a special chemical or yeah. something? Okay. Thank you. Hold your breath. Yeah. Okay. You'll take your breath away. Okay. Because I, I know the sensitivity of the camera. kind of equipment since my husband was an engineer. Mm -hmm. And some of these contracts, if you look at them, I mean, uh, both work for one. Uh, we've had the, the folks in here for a while. Um, and I made a transposing problem on there, too, that I had 11000 for um, repairs and improvement. Actually, it should have been on a contractual side because we did go out last year and look at new vendors that come in and take care of the uh, Oak Brook supply. Um, and we didn't find anybody cheaper than Oak Brook at the time. So that's why we had looked at three or four vendors, and most of them were over you know, eleven thousand dollars. So that's why you have budgeted. And as you decide to go out this uh, September, I think the contract is due. Uh, you probably need some more money to cover that cost. Right? Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Can I just ask one question sure. before you go for, uh, uh, any further um, regarding ABC automatic mm -hmm. building controls? Yes. I know you mentioned it's computerized. Is it computerized so you can control it here or do they only control it? No, we control it here. You can't way. control it here. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay. There is no remote no remote access. access. Here. Okay. I can remote access from my house if I have to, but they're not allowed in our system unless they're here. Okay, I got it. Okay. So you have to control those, yes. so we don't need to rely on them. No. All right, that's fine. I mean, but if something, unfortunately, it's all, again, computerized, so if something modular or something would go on in this thing. We got to get those guys sure. in and replace those things. Sure, sure. Sure. You know, it's, it's their brain time. Okay, no, I understand. Thank you. I know a lot of vendors that I do work with. I mean, we have a pretty good rapport with them. So, a lot of times, if there's parts that are needed, I'll go out and buy the parts and they'll install the parts on some of, on some of, the, some of the bigger stuff. Unfortunately, I can't control some of the bigger stuff, sure. but a lot of the smaller stuff, belts, Freon, uh, things like that, smaller motors. I can go out and buy, purchase that stuff and help solve it. So, uh, also on the um, Pony, the, the uh, elevator, that is all inclusive as far as the contract goes with their services every quarter. But all small parts for elevators, all, all the uh, motors, the doors, larger larger components, unfortunately, are not covered under it, but all, a lot of the smaller stuff is covered. So we never receive a bill other than our quarterly maintenance unless it's not really big. That's the next, and then that's also the national contract for lobbying. So that's that's covered. They're the lowest lowest bidder on for that uh, contract. And also the um, Johnstone, they also do the uh, burglar alarm as well. So that's what the other contract is on there. 
And then it's also all inclusive contract as well. So that covers all parts. I just thought of one other thing. Um, we have security cameras, don't mm -hmm. we? Is that connected that's, with? No, that's ours. That's, our, that's in house. That's all in house. Oh, okay. That's okay. Rich's, Rich's. We all have control. He has the master control. I have screens in my office. Um, different people have screens in their office so we can monitor what's going on in the library at different times of the time. Okay. And it's helpful so if something does happen, we can go back and get a record of it and then you know, share it with the police department. Okay, great, great, thank you. I would assume that you have you have a tape or something that records. Yes. And you can it records for a day or something. That's 30, 30 days. 30 days. 30 days. 30 days. And it's actually a hard drive, Joe. But it's all digital. Any other contract? No, no, I'm fine with that. Move on to staffing. Um, as you see, my last day is December 31st, and this is a G year guy. He's a good man. He knows he knows the building. So he can so wait, are you going to be two departments with? Uh, yes, I'll be uh, supervising the staff. I'll do the maintenance and security department. So uh, the plan is to get somebody to replace David with a lower salary break mm -hmm. and take care of a lot of the day-to-day -day things yes. that Dave is doing currently. Mm -hmm. And that person uh, would actually manage the staff you see here and then report to uh, Rich. Cool. Okay. The two departments are pretty closely intertwined uh, in, in a lot of respects, and it just makes a lot of yeah. Sense. I like I say I've seen them working together quite a bit when I've been here, so I can relate to that. Okay. My, the staff that I do have currently, I have five gentlemen that are working for me currently. I have uh, one replacement that I would need in time here, um, because we are here from uh, open to close every day, seven days a week. Once we go back, if we go back to our normal schedule, seven days a week. My guys are here around here. In the morning, first thing open it up or close it up at night time. Uh, so we are here and we are interacting with most departments every day. So. Can I also just throw in that they also interact with security and they're a huge asset to supervisors and the staff in this building. They are, we, we depend on them so thoroughly. So, sorry, Clinton. Question for that. We move on to the next portion of it. Special reserve plan. Again, from the roof to the basement, and the roof was under this year for uh, replacement, but uh, we're still uh, negotiations still going on with that, and we'll see where that leads us to. And then the next uh, piece of that is I've got a, some money in there for some grounds repairs, which is a sidewalk. On the east side at the uh, employee's entrance, I've got a, where the air intake is for the old boiler system. There's some cracks in the uh, intake housing of it, and also there's a nice big crack across the side. So that needs that's something that we need to replace that. And then um, also the parking lot, it's probably about time to research this with some. Uh, uh, Crack repairs, things like that, and some restriping because I think the last time we did it was about five years ago, I think it was. And I think maybe uh, three, yeah, four, maybe four, maybe four, okay. maybe four years. So that it's about time to replace the stripes and kind of reseal it, put some new, uh, you know, fill the cracks up so you don't have major issues going up moving forward. Um, and then the pavers in the front of the building, um, by the portico, those are kind of if you walk which you had you can see how they're crowning a little bit and then on either end of it there's trip hazards because mm -hmm. they're settling down so by them settling down when people walk across there they if they're not paying attention somebody's gonna fall and hurt themselves up there so that that needs to be replaced as well and the benches I, I think we've looked at the benches that we've talked about redoing those benches up there for years yes and that in the, in the, and the two that are in the uh, portico and the four that are out there in the veterans area out there, 
some of those things that need to be replaced, and some of that stuff is going to be costly to be replaced. Um, and also, once we do the uh, benches, that we're going to also have to do the papers out into the veterans area out there as well. So that's why the price tag is on there for fifteen thousand dollars. Benches are you would put down to about five thousand. That's just a general estimate, but just to redo the benches, to have them uh, taken out and stripped and re stenciled, I've had quotes as high as two thousand dollars just to strip them. Do you think, do you think that's all those benches? They aren't some of them really worn where they may need, the wood may need to be replaced. I mean, when I looked at it, well, yeah, it that's it. So, that, so that, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to maybe possibly go with a different material instead of the uh, hardened wood that's out there currently because then i think the last time we did that was when the boy scouts did it for us yeah and that's what we always try to do is we try to get an organization in here that's would like to do something like that even then we have a lot of boy scout eagles scouts that were getting their uh things mm -hmm. getting done through the through the scouts they would come in and do it we provide the paint the lacquer or whatever needed to be done we take them apart they take them and they bring them back once they're finished but unfortunately and i think a few of them were st john repos but lately, there's not the interest anymore. So it's hard to hard to get these kids to bring them in here. And, and there's a project also that the boys would take down versus the girls who are at the same level. Right. The girls have to do different, totally different type of projects. Can I can I ask one more question? Sure. I know the papers are an issue, and it seems like they extend all the way through the benches. Mm -hmm. So would the paper papers be? Replaced or 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 leveled. They would be reset. We okay. use try to reuse the papers we currently have, but they have to be taken off. Right. It's, it's more manual labor exactly. than anything else. Take them up, resurface, and then reset. Set it. Okay. Would that be done um, before those benches are redone? Is that how? We try to get the benches beforehand, so we okay. know how to set everything in place. Okay. So there may be a rough, some rough edges that if we get the benches replaced. There'll be some rough edges before they come back in. Okay. We want to get the get the benches set before the papers get back. Okay, I got it. That'd be the easiest way. To do. Okay, great, thank you. But also on the uh, line as well, there was a on the east side of the building as well. There's a, a limestone ledge that's out there. And there's along the windows in the lower level. If you walk out there, you can see how it's taken toll on the uh, bronze. Uh, frames and windows. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that the limestone is no longer uh, coated. The acid rains over the years, and just different things go on. And when it rains on it, it splatters all over the windows and all the frames and everything. And eventually, the frames that you're going to wind up having to replace that brown, the bronze frames if the limestone is not taken care of. So, so they have to be taken care of, you're saying, just by coating it? or No, no, they have, have to be replaced. They have to be replaced. They have to be taken. Is it advisable to replace it with limestone again? It would be a different material. It would be similar, but it would be a different material. It would look the same, but be different. Right. Yeah. Something that would be harder, a little, longer, longer rigid, lasting. Yeah, a little more rigid. Okay, cool. Cool. Rigid. Thank you. Yep. And then the, the bottom part of that is actually Rich is already in. Into that he's on his uh the phone system which he's up uh, into replacing the you know, or assigned companies into replacing and then the switches uh, and then the rest of the stuff back here is typically affect uh some of that stuff being forwarded in the sorter and all that stuff we talk about that question for that no it's just when you were talking about the live stuff because i'm my Family was in construction quite a bit, and that, that kind of threw me off. We're not replacing that with what already is deteriorating, are we? No. Okay, so. Cool. We'll do Does anyone have any questions? I guess we're good. Okay. Um, the next one is the uh, repairs and improvements. Um, basically, some of the interior construction, we just, we have a Six thousand dollars in that line. That's, that'll cover some of it. If we need repairing some desk or some walls or you know whatever, if, we, if something's moved, at that point we call in uh, either a champion or uh, Mylon manufacturer. At that point, if we needed something to be re repaired or replaced, they are, are finishing 
contractors. That's what the line is here for six thousand um, dollars. Door locks um, and washroom auto closer doors and things like that. I usually go down to Anderson Lock, which is here on Oakton Street in the Plains. They're my main suppliers for my keys and all my locks, uh, different different things like that. If I need parts, I will always go down to Anderson and purchase purchase stuff from them. Instead of having them come out, I sometimes I need to have them come out and service something that I can't fix. You know, sometimes that happens. Uh, Home Depot, um, basically, as you can see, it's the Gordon Garden Club. They go across across the way and they pick up. Uh, flower pots and flowers and things for the pots in the front of the building because of the front of the building and the um, uh, is it the area, area, the area is the, the memorial, the, the memorial, the memorial on, this, on the east side of the building and the pots in front of the building are done by the garden club. Okay. So we provide the plants and they do all the planting of all that stuff like that. Cool. Then this is the one to Oakbrook. I kind of got that flipped around. Unfortunately, that's should be under um, contractual. Um, village plumbing or Slater plumbing or whoever at that point in fall, uh, repairs and rotting of the uh, sewers, which we have done a couple times a year. We have a, uh, a main drain on the uh, north side of the building here, on the east side of the building, they need to be um, rotted out a couple times a year, unfortunately, um, because of the uses of it and the, the slope. When they built the building, is not always the greatest. So we have to help stuff get into the sewers. So that's why that's what that is up for. Um, the building electric, electrical repairs, that is um, mainly we have some issues where um, contactors would go out. There's a contactor in the children's department currently that may be on its last leg that we may need to replace. Some of those contactors can be as much as. Two to three thousand dollars. And so, if we need to replace that, we're going to need, need money to replace that. Um, and then there's also a, a line of lights that are in um, the children's area that, have, due to age, have cracked the lenses. And I, I can't get the lenses to be replaced. Um, I've tried uh, three different times for the manufacturer of plastics to come in to retrofit it. And every time the first one fell out, the second one slipped out, and the third one I couldn't get it once. So that, I mean, they've tried, and it's just it's so it's such a uh, close gap on how it's held in there that if it's not perfect, it's not going to stay. And what happens is over time, because of the heat that's trans transferred in there, it's plastic. It hardens when you go to pull it off your cracks. So it's something that's probably down the line that's going to probably be needed to replace. That could be as much as you know. Fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars, just for the uh, fixtures. How, how many fixtures are there? There's seven, seven fixtures mm -hmm. in, in the line that will have okay. to be replaced. And around, it's all it's a wall wash, is what it's called, and it's it's. it's so it's near the wall where it's. It's actually it's, it's on the, the shelves. Yep. Yeah, okay. Top of the shelf, yeah. Okay. I think I know where you're talking. And about. I have to replace the bulbs in there because I don't want kids going in there. And, you know, throwing a book up there or something. Yeah. So, <laughs> not that they would do that, but oh, never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> like accident happened now. I believe it should, yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, I believe it. First case there is rich can do it next. <laughs> no. Um it should be. I think it, it should be first of And then as far as paints and stuff like that, we do a lot of our own house painting. We try to we try to avoid calling any contractors in if we can. We try to Keep as much stuff in the house as we can for the painting and repairs and redecorating, you know, whatever whatever needs to be done. Somebody offices, you know, once in a while when people come and go, we have to freshen them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the gallery upstairs is always a, uh, we always like to keep that nice and fresh. And before we reopen, I just painted the whole uh, third floor south, south end of the building where all the tables along the wall and then the other north wall we painted, we just painted all that up there just before we reopened. So, but $2,000 would be close. Uh, the next one is small repairs of vacuums and uh, small motor items. I use, uh, send some of that stuff out. Instead of trying to buy new, sometimes we try to replace what we have. And I have one piece of equipment that's here is uh, got to be 15, 16 years old. And 
it's, it's, it's working. That's big blue vacuum that, that they push around. And it's, it's about a two foot wide vacuum that it cleans quite an area at a time. But as time goes on, it gets a little tighter. So, in order to you know, repair that, it costs a few dollars. Um, and then the tractor is our uh, snow removal tractor. Uh, and I think we just spent $800 on a new um, spread, salt spread last year. That's to help us cut down. That's again to help us cut down on costs from uh, vendors coming into the building. Uh, I do have a service that comes in and cleans the majority of the, the uh, uh, lot. But we do the sidewalks and everything else that we get out of the tractor to put salt things like that to save money. Well. The tractor is about 20 years old. Yeah. And uh, we had major repairs done to it last year where the uh, bottom plates were uh, actually rusting out. I mean, they were just about dragging speed as we uh, drove the tractor. And we're doing the Flintstone. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I was thinking. So, uh, this year, what happened is the uh, some parts on the back end uh, related to the salt spreader froze, and there was nothing that we could do to uh, get them to release. So we, you know, every year it's something because this piece of equipment is about 20 years old, uh, and it's always dealing with that corrosive uh, uh, salt in the winter time. So, you know, as much as we try to maintain it. You know, realistically, this, how much can you? Yeah, it, it's 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 tricky. I think that what's a new one? Uh, the, the new one I looked at was probably about $27,000. Yeah, so you can kind of probably 30000 overall, uh, you know, to replace it. $1,000 every every so often is, uh, isn't so bad to keep it every year. Right. Um, we have any questions on that? No, I'm done. Okay. Our next one is the maintenance service, which I again all you we have all the contracts and all those. Um, the only thing I don't, the only thing you don't have, I believe, is smithereens because um, they still are not in their uh, offices currently, so they can't get into the files to send me over a contract. We've been a, a customer of smithereens since two thousand two or two thousand three or something like that. And it's a recurring contract. Um, and it's it's not a lot of money to keep the uh, uh, place clean and keep uh, all the pests and you know, people from screaming at their mice and things running, running in the corner. And we don't we have never had an issue like that where we've had anything. Oh, weather inspection uh, by law we have to have the um, boilers inspected every two years and by state law. And if it's not state law, it's our insurance company because the insurance company is the one that requested that the boiler be checked because they want to make sure the safeties are working, make sure everything is in working order. Um, depends on the you have to pay off. Well, I mean, the whole back of the building doesn't want to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the inspectors will request that we, I take the boilers apart so they can truly look inside of them and see if the firing and everything is working the way it should or the firewall is in operating condition. All the um, vessel is open and free of rust. So that's, that's required by all. So some of the older ones. And then also the, um, yeah, there's, there's four, we have four boilers. Uh, one is a steam boiler. Two are right now are the uh, main workhorse. There's the newer boilers that we purchased in the reconstruction. And the older Bryant is, uh, it's been here for, 98 was that was the workhorse since 98 and that boiler still in service it's a backup boiler in case one of the other uh newer boilers decide to go on vacation it helps out oh, there they. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, oh, the monarch the monarch fire protection is for our sprinkler sprinkler system which are the uh, fire pumps which when the um, fire, if the, the fire um, water system is ever activated in the library, this is what opens it up and this is what tells the fire department there's a fire in the building. That's what they why they come to uh, investigate to see what happens with the with the uh, fire system. Um, monitoring system we have. 
Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, this is the, the maintenance service, which I think some of us we've covered already with the uh, building plumbing maintenance, um, the GMA cleaning uh, service, which is a, a daily service, which I have two folks that come in every evening uh, for $125 a day. I have two of them in here for uh, together would be five hours. So basically you're paying these people $12.50 an hour for five hours of work for two people. They clean all the hard surfaces in the public, uh, vacuum the floors, clean whatever else needs to be cleaned. They clean all the washrooms, the sinks, the uh, uh, commodes, the floors, and everything is mine daily. And they come in after we're closed. Um, group that's that's a, that's a given. We have to do that. Uh, Western Navigation, you already have. Um, some of this is again, this is the 10,000 foot with the ballast and everything. Um, the ballast and the lights in this building, everything here by law has to be recycled, so we can't just throw them in the garbage can. Anything batteries, ballast, light bulbs. Computers, everything in this building has to be recycled. If you don't recycle something and the um, federal government finds out that you've thrown it in the garbage, which Groot is a good one to turn you in because Groot will charge you extra to pick the stuff up. So if you throw it out, the fines start about $20,000. Or uh, fines if, you, if they find that you've uh, discarded the uh, ballast or light bulbs. So you have to go through a special service? For yes. yes. That's, all, that's all sent to us, a whole different service. Uh, and then the uh, the uh, Niles uh, vending stickers we have to have there for vending machine. Um, also, the fire safety system that's what's called the red center. Those are the people that uh, monitor our alarm if the fire alarm goes off. Uh, it's a wireless system in the basement for our, our fire panel. So if anything comes up on on the screen, this is the company that automatically calls in the fire department. Yes. Yep. On that, uh, the uh, we have the main sewers running twice a year, yes. because they're not uh, at the right angle to drain off. It's because of the pitch of some of the sewers, and then of, of course it's the usage of well as well. Because when it was built in 1959, is was the original sewer on the east side. And the sewer that's on the uh, Oakland Street side here, it, uh, the main sewer from this building is across the street in the gentleman's lawn over there is how far it has to go across for it to get to the main sewer. But it's quite a push. Right. Yeah. You know, this one's probably located just where we yeah. are and goes all the way over. All the way over. Uh, yeah. So if it's not... If are are they both with um, improper pitch or just one? The one on the east side is probably in proper because I we've had some work done on the um, the outlet box before it goes in Oakland into the main into the main uh, street. Uh, we've had that kind of refit so that it doesn't collect over there, so it kind of takes out into the. Into the, into the main and and how much do they charge you to ride the? I just had a bill. I just actually I think I put it in the system uh, this afternoon for the uh, last time they were here. It's about twelve hundred four. So and that's twice about, a year. Twice a year. So that would be about twenty five hundred a year. Right. But that's that's if then that's if it's a good year and I only have to have it around it twice, which is the main, the main, usually the main uh rotting. But in the interim, sometimes you get kids that decide to load up yeah. paper. Yeah. And I then if I have a main backup, now I gotta get a back out again. So it could be five thousand right. And they also do the uh sewers in the, in the parking lot. We also have the sewers in the parking lot. <coughs> they they do that at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. We do not want that back in No. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> because we have facilities that are below the grade, mm -hmm. um, namely the boiler uh, basement in the north. And uh, for whatever reason, um, from up there to, to some AT and T. Person decided that that's where our D mark is going to be, and our internet and our phone lines go right in there. 
Um, so uh, the area that we're going to be fixing in the east, that is the uh, air intake for the boilers, um, that area there uh, has a drain, and that drain is lower than uh, the break, and the water will start backing up in there and flowing down as a cascade. But that, that, that's our alarm system. Yes, that's our alarm system. <laughs> when, when, we, when the uh, outreach program is set, I hear a leak in the basement. All the alarm. It's leaking over. That's our alarm system. I just ask one question sure. on this GMA cleaning wants to come up. What exactly is that again? I'm sorry. That's our cleaning service that they provide in the evening. Okay. Those are the folks that I have in, in the evening that come in uh, right now six days a week. If we go back to our normal hours, they'll be here seven days a week. Uh, they do the cleaning after, afterwards. They do all the yeah, hard services and all the public services. Thank you. Thank you. We actually had, uh, used to have an overnight person. And the all-in cost with the benefits was about uh, somewhere between sixty-five and seventy thousand uh, dollars. You know that's uh, uh, insurance and then the old uh, retirement plan, uh, etc. Yeah. And when he left, uh, we took advantage of uh, his departure to be placed for the service for less than half the cost. And the janitorial line, I think, is on the one sheet that I didn't go over, but that. That is kind of where I buy all my um, supplies as far as you know, toilet paper, paper towel, um, plastic bags, light bulbs, different things like that. So I would need to uh, keep the bills running. Are there any questions from the even trustee? Nothing wrong. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Andrew. You're welcome. Andrew. So I have a question for the trustees. Um, I don't know if you want to discuss anything further, but now I think we need to that. We need to figure out what's going on with the June 14th budget meeting. Can I ask you a question? When will you be back in time? Will you be back to come on the 15th? I think because that happens to be the total over time. Because first, there's time to flip overs in order to, you know, there's how many weeks? I know, but Greg has to take the numbers from that meeting and Compile them to okay, the well, then I don't hours like that. Unless then we'd have to meet this. Right. Um, as far as the June 16th board meeting, which is when I think he thought we would have the the final budget and, and the, the um, 30 days after that he would have to file it. Can that date be moved? And if we can't money. accommodate the first draft. So uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, it's a two-step process, essentially, where first you uh, pass a tentative budget, and then 30 days later, you have at least 30 days later, mm -hmm. you could do more. Uh, you have a uh, hearing, and then you vote on the final budget. So if you're able to pass the tentative budget on the 16th, then that means you pass the uh, uh, final budget July 21st, which is which is the next regular board meeting, uh, and that gives us enough time, you know, for those. Nice. Okay. How much if, extra? If you delay the um, the meeting on the 14th, as a matter of fact, the 14th starts to you know push the limits a little bit, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, then you, if you push further from the 14th, then you definitely can't pass the uh, tentative budget on the 21st because you won't have time 48 hours in advance of, of the 16th meeting to put out the uh, tentative uh, ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, on the 14th, which is the Monday preceding yes. the 16th, mm -hmm. um, you really should be done uh, with the tentative ordinance and have that available to the public no later than 6.30, so that you mm -hmm. meet the, the strict 48-hour 
uh, advanced posting rules. On the 14th, we should have the tentative budget by 630, which would mean if that was the day we were going to bring all this yeah. to a discussion, right. we have to do it. We don't no, we'd have to do it. I don't think we can do it. We can't. We can't do it before the 14th. Well, I mean, the you There's know, the 14th puts you into next week, next week right. and doesn't give you enough time okay. to absorb all of this information plus the information. Right. From, uh, what is our what is our deadline as far as we go into August or September even to have that? By law, uh, by law, you can uh, pass the final uh, budget, I believe, in September. Uh, was it for Tuesday? I think we've done that before at Council Layer. Yeah. I did bring it with me. I so remember doing that. It's on the well, uh, it's on the legal calendar. What we used to do on a routine basis uh, until a few years ago was, was pass the budget at the August meeting. <laughs> pass the final budget at the August mm -hmm. meeting. Now the problem with that is that you run a couple of months into the new fiscal year, um, all of July and a major part of August, with you know uh, without definite plans on what to do. So you need some sort of continuing resolution, like they do uh, at the federal level, that says pay payroll, run programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Except that very often there are some uh, special costs. For example, the Fourth of July uh, parade. Mm -hmm. Are we in or are we out? We know that the Brandon Heights party uh, at the end of the parade is not going to happen, but it still costs uh, uh, money to. Uh, I believe the cost to enter. I believe. It uh, it costs for the things that we give out, you know, whether it's a fan with our name imprinted on it or a pencil or, or something like that, um, uh, in order to, you know, have, you know, kind of a successful uh, presence there. So, you know, in, in any event, we need some guidance, you know, specifically for the 4th of July, if we're in or out. And we also need, we also need to make sure that we have something in place that allows the library to function on an ongoing basis until this budget is ultimately passed. Would it be so, a good idea? Excuse me. A good idea to have another meeting after the 16th, like the next week, and and then uh, uh, present our tentative budget at that, that point. You uh, you could do that to start the clock running, but uh, then you can't. Have a meeting to pass the final budget until at least 30 days past that. That would be the uh, end of July. Uh, possibly, I, depending yeah. on when you want to meet. And we could have a special meeting for that just for that purpose also. Well, in, can at I the end of July. All right. Because we're, we're, we started late with this whole process. And All right, can I just get some clarification? Sure. Back to the date we scheduled for June 14th, which isn't going to work. Wasn't that the day we planned to discuss all of this information and then come up with? I thought that was the tentative budget, but it's not. It's just us discussing everything, correct? Yeah, the tentative budget has got to be uh, issued 48 hours or available to the public 48 hours before you go down as part of the board's package. Okay, so if, if, if that's the part I did, you said that before, but I'm not. Yeah, it's an ordinance. Okay. So, so it's an actual so, so they, yeah, okay. So can I wait, please, Patty, let me just finish that because I'm so confused. Here. So if we so if we were able to meet on the 14th and discuss all this information, then we would have had a tentative budget for the 16th, which just happens to be a budget, I mean a board. A regular meeting. board meeting. Yeah. So can we can we do the can we not have the 14th um but move it to I don't know trusty um Adams, I don't know when you're due back, but could we do it a different day that week and then have the tentative budget two days after that? Could we still fit it in at least in that week? That well, I mean, it, I mean, it would depend on everybody's schedules. I mean, I, I, there's no legal barrier that I'm aware of uh, that would prevent you from having another meeting. I, I just, I don't, I really, I'm uncomfortable with beginning the year without a budget and making sure we don't forget this and having all these resolutions. I, I'd like to see us try to come up with a schedule. 
Um, Trustee King Adams, when are you due back from your vacation on the 15th? Okay. So that's the day before the budget, the board meeting. Mm -hmm. And and I think we need um can I suggest maybe we do on the uh, on the 16th uh, most of what we're gonna do on, on the 14th. And it's a board meeting. Uh, it's kind of tight, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's you have done it before, but I suspect from all the conversation that you are going to have quite a few things that you yeah. have to hammer out. So I think that would take a whole meeting all by itself. We could try to not have very much business on that agenda. You still would have the approval of minutes, approval of payroll, things like that. But we need to um, approve the insurance. Uh, okay, it's insurance. Other than that, there's not a lot that would have to be covered. Or, or if we well, move that uh, 14th meeting to the uh, next. Tuesday or Monday. No, that's too far. That's the, then you got to go 30 days from that date. Yeah, you got to be within the 20 days. Yeah, that's. Well, we would have to move the July meeting also. Um, well, here's what I'm thinking. Can we can we work with that? Can you any of you work with that one week? Could could you think of? I, I mean, Trustee King Adams, you come back the 15th. I mean, to have a, a a huge meeting as soon as you come back. That's a bit tough. So that's how I plan my vacation in order to be back for that meeting. So whatever we need to do that day. For the 16th or the 15th? I plan to be back on the 15th so that I would be here on the 16th. This was, I okay, planned this so a long time ago. So. so, oh no, that's fine. So the 16th is the board meeting. But we won't have. We won't Is that have a closed meeting? Or no, no. So that. But, but like Susan suggested, if we don't cover a lot of business, just mostly the budget stuff, we could possibly get most of it knocked out on the 16th. And then if we need enough, basically the tentative budget meeting isn't very long, is it? Is, is that where we normally so as, as, Susan, as Susan said, it, it seems like there's going to be uh, quite a bit of discussion uh, to, to arrive at, at final numbers. So it's helpful to be a longer meeting. Yeah, it could be. And then what has to happen once the final number, once you provide the final numbers, those numbers have got to be updated and then uh, imported into a, an ordinance mm -hmm. uh, called a tentative ordinance yeah. for you guys to you know consider it to pass. Yeah, but for the actual passing of it, that's what I'm asking. Well, I mean, the 16th the, the of will be a long meeting. But the I'm passage saying, is just a vote. I mean, yeah, so I mean, that we can just come in and do I at a later time, that week even, probably, right? Well, the key is to get this one day that we are going to discuss the budget finalized. And then two days later is when the, um, when, uh, what's that called? Um, Two days after budget. That's when he'll need two days for that. So if we have a regular board meeting on Wednesday, which isn't feasible for this conversation, the next day is Thursday or Friday. And if it's Thursday, then two days would be Monday. If it's Friday, two days would be Tuesday. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think I follow. So if we had, if Thursday was the meeting, if if we picked Thursday to discuss this budget, mm -hmm. the seventeenth. Thursday the 17th. Yes. Two yeah. days later would be the tentative budget, right? You well, okay. So yeah. once you once you finish the numbers, then I take those numbers and I have to put them in the form right. of the tentative budget. So let's let's just walk through it for a moment. Let's say we have the meeting on the 17th. Mm -hmm. Um I would I would need it at least until the beginning of the following week, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the beginning of the following week would be the 21st. Um, uh, I, I believe, right? The 14th, and then the 21st is the beginning of the following week, week which puts us. Um, well, we're talking about. I, I, I think that puts us exactly 30 days. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's exactly. So, so um, if you have no choice, it has to be on Monday. But, you know, we would have to have the. We would have to have the tentative budget available to the public 48 hours prior to that. So that you know that puts us to you know Thursday, oh. which we you know which we wouldn't be able to do because we're meeting on Thursday. 
So are you saying we have to meet sooner than Thursday in order to accommodate the 21st? Is that where we're at? I, 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 I think you have uh, you have multiple options. One easy option I see is uh, is uh, letting the process uh, flow and do it either at the August meeting or some date in between the July meeting and the August meeting. So you know, and that would fit very comfortably. That we have done. The other fourth week of July. Yes. What would make it? Excuse me, it's just a uh, uh, The other option that's that's readily apparent to me is that uh, is that you could uh, uh, schedule uh, you know a, a special meeting or a series of special meetings to both discuss the budget and to pass the tentative ordinance. Um, and then maybe another special meeting in July, but that's very messy. I mean, you're, yeah, I mean yes. we're already meeting, I think, six times or, yes. or five yeah. times on, on the budget. So, you know, I, you know, I think very often, uh, you know, keeping it simple, you know, the KISS method uh, is probably uh, is probably more advisable, at least from where I sit. It's all up to you guys. Well, my concern is I didn't want to wait too long to have this discussion. I mean, we I mean, we have one more day. We will, would have heard all the departments. I don't want to wait three weeks and meet to discuss it. I'd like to try to do that sooner. But I'm not sure about this 21st date that you mentioned. You mentioned we can extend it as far as July or August. But what's prevalent about the 21st? Am I missing something? Uh, the, what, the 21st of so, uh, June. What's right? Is that a significant date? For so, if you wanted to do final passage of the budget at the July 21st meeting, you that means that you have got to have passed the, uh, you, you must have passed the tentative by the 21st and given notice. For the meeting on the 21st of July okay. for the public hearing and the passage of, okay. of the uh of the budget. And we have to meet on Thursday if we want to do that on the 21st. Well, what I'm saying is is that I don't if you remember, if we meet on Thursday, yeah, uh, we will not be able to have the tentative budget out, uh, the tentative budget ordinance out 48 hours in advance of Monday. Because you would, have, hours would be Monday. you would actually have to have it posted by 6 30 on Thursday. So oh. Oh. you could reverse it though. You could do this, you could have the budget meeting on the 16th and the regular meeting on the Thursday. Oh, and that gives you the days you need. Oh, okay. there is no problem changing that as long as we do it in yeah, yes, 48 hours in advance. It's, it's very quick though. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I mean, my, my point is, is that, well, you know, best case scenario for me, no changes. You know, I could put the, I could put the tentative budget uh, ordinance together tomorrow morning, and it's no problem. The more changes you make, the more complexity there is because of the way that the spreadsheets flow, mm -hmm. and the more error checking I have to try to do to make sure that what you intend is actually re reflected. In, Right, I so, um, you know, no changes, it's no problem. Lots of changes, we need more time. Okay. Well, what do you think about Wednesday for the budget and then Thursday for the board meeting? Thursday the 17th? Yeah, are those the dates? I'm not paying attention. Yeah, the budget, the board meeting is scheduled for the 16th. And we switch it to the budget. Mm -hmm. And then the next day would be the board meeting. Did that work for you guys? Um, it's fine with me. You don't have to work. I'll just switch it. Okay, good. Because she works nice. night, so that's where I would like that. What, what uh, so the board meeting in July will be the budget. Yes, sure. I think yes, the next day after will be the board meeting. Uh -huh. In June. June. Yes, that's okay. Uh, is, is there a, one other possibility? Is possibly a uh, trustee at P and Adams? Are, are, could you possibly make the meeting if it was at seven o'clock on, on Tuesday? Maybe you're arriving back at 
four in the afternoon? Or? Oh, I think that's, uh, you know, I'm traveling with three kids, so I don't yeah. want to make any plans. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, you know, no, I don't think it's not. A, oh, I would be afraid of that. I would be afraid or something. <laughs> Okay, no, let's 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 do the um but again Carol, mm -hmm. uh, even switching the meetings, mm -hmm. you know, I'm depending on the number of changes. Oh I and how confident I feel. You may not be able to uh, vote on the tenders of portions on Monday because it may take me longer than the time that yeah, in order to be the four okay. hours. I understand. I understand. Okay. But absolutely not. Okay. It won't be the problem. It's, it's possible. Anything is, like I said, fewer changes, easier to do. Yeah. Right. Lots right. of changes, harder to do. I think you want it to be right. Oh, definitely. You know, that the most the best. Exactly. Was there a reason that next week is that too early? Yeah, I, I'd like to absorb this. Yeah. Um, there's but a lot of absorption going on. We still have one more day of departments. Yes, we do. I can go then. <laughs> no, thank you. You already, okay. what did you do? Wave your time over that term. I yield. I yield. already yielded. Yeah. So the 16th will be uh, a budget. Yes. Uh, we think the 17th will be regular board. Yes. Is there no 14th then? No. 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 Do we need to check with uh, Olivia? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give her a call. Well, hopefully, since it's a, since we're switching the board meeting to a budget meeting, mm -hmm. that should be okay. She I'll, knows I'll some work off shifts, does she? Because it might affect her work schedule. She works yeah. off shifts. I know, I know. We'll see. She told me just to call her when we decide. Okay. So is, there, is there a budget meeting? Is there a, a meeting on the 21st of June? No, because what? Okay. No, because it wasn't based on the, the 14th, 16th schedule. Well, the 22nd, yeah, is. isn't that our board meeting? I'm, I'm thinking, thinking so, oh, I'm, I'm thinking. Let me start over, please. The I'm 16th is the, no 14th meeting. The 16th, Wednesday, is a budget meeting. Yes. The 17th, Thursday, is the regular board yes. meeting. I'm sorry, is I'm there, thinking to there is a meeting on the 21st to pass the tentative ordinance. On Monday the 21st. Oh, you're right. So I'm not sure I'll have the time to be prepared for that meeting and meet the 48-hour notice rules under the open meeting set. So what should we do? One of, um, so well, like I said, the easiest thing would be to pass it in August. I know you're uncomfortable with that. Okay. Um, something else that we could, uh, that you might contemplate is passing the tentative ordinance with the numbers as they are at, you know, either the 16th or the, uh, either the 16th or the 17th. And then if the final one is adjusted? No. If you do that, it's a tentative ordinance and it could change to your heart's content. There are no limits on the changes for the final. Okay. But you may be uncomfortable. I, I'd rather not do that. And then I guess we have, so we have no choice but then to go to August because we're not sure if you'll be, what if you can't make it for the 21st? Can't we change it then or is it too late? Uh, is there, there, there's no reason it couldn't be the 22nd, right? I don't know. That we can't pass oh, the final meeting. Yes. Yeah. 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 So why, why can't we change the, the date of you July? Can change, you can change any date you want. We could change the 21st of July till the 23rd. But, you know, I mean, you're. Right. You know, when you start changing uh, the dates of all of your regular meetings, you have, you have a lack of consistency that makes it hard for people, people who want to attend well, to attend. Yeah. I think to get this budget finalized, we put so much time in it, we need to just come up with what works best. But about your, somebody just said that we could not um, finalize it, or what's the word, the tentative on the 21st will go to the 22nd. And what that means is in, oh, July 21st is a 
board meeting that you don't want to mess with? Well, I don't think you want to. Generally speaking, I don't think you want to, to change too many regular. No, you're right. Meetings. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't feel like we would be changing to. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. So what do we do now? We jump to August. Is that our only other alternative? Yeah. yeah well, I think I think, it's right. I think there's as as many different uh, options as you can think of, but the easiest would be to go to August. And okay. Go to so that would and. Give uh, give us uh, give the library some guidance on what to do in the interim period of time. Okay. Wow. You know, and, but one of the things that I need is some sort of uh, you know some sort of uh, direction on the fourth on the fourth of July because we're right at the point where either we do it or we don't do it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, for this year, yeah. not for next. Year. You know, we haven't set the schedule for the meetings that was on our agenda for next uh, for the 16th is the uh, setting the meeting dates for the 21, 22 uh, year. We'll do it on the board meeting date. Yeah, that and we, we have the option to move that July meeting to a different date. But again, it does start to confuse the residents who, you know, you do have to keep your some consistency. Yeah, yeah, because normally yeah. it's yeah, let's, you know, to... let's not engage in that conversation. Let's get back to, to only because we need to finalize this. So I'd rather not rush. So that means wait till 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 you. Okay. No, I agree. I agree. So can we still we'll still have our we'll still have our meeting on so we'll have our budget meeting on Thursday and we'll keep our June board meeting on Wednesday and we won't finalize this until August. Okay. Good works. All right. And then as far as um the fourth of July, did we I don't even know what the status is of that. I don't remember what you had done. We have a meeting on Wednesday. I think it's an extra report. No, but no, he wants to partake in it. Yeah, in order for him to participate. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, oh. what month is it? It's June. Yeah. It's yeah, June. It's like he has to go because he has to go. Yeah. I think so the library well, can participate. Should participate in the parade, for sure. Yeah. So, and, and the parade is not going to be at Grenon Heights. Uh, it's going to be the parade, but there's going to be no yeah, after parade. No, exactly. Right. Which will save some money. So, is there a price to the to just being in the parade? Do we have that? I mean, there is no price to. The Sasha had estimated two thousand. No, there is no cost. That's what I Sasha had estimated two thousand, uh, including Brennan Heights. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's reasonable to cut that in half. If you have a number that you would like us to stick to, we can well, do that. I'm trying to figure out what what he, I thought he gave us a breakdown. Oh, yeah. he, he had uh, it was listed under estimated two thousand, but that was that included giveaways in at uh, Granite Heights. Right, but I think I think what so, he did say was there were T-shirts for the parade, and I thought we give out candy. Yeah, I think that every so every so I think he had that. an itemized cost for that. But he had specific yeah. reasons. Yeah, if you I just tell us how much you're willing to spend, he, he can find something that fits whatever you're willing to spend. I, I think uh, Greg's advice of going, you know, because we're not going to be at the park with, with all the giveaways, we'll give away some stuff probably, you know, within the free candy or whatever to give away. Uh, the thousand dollars, I think, is, is okay. How's that? All right, done. Okay, yes. I agree. Thousand dollars is good. For a thousand. All right, and so now do we have these dates for the budget finalized. Okay, can you repeat them again? Because we've been all over creation. Okay, 16th is a regular board meeting now. Mm -hmm. Same. 17th is a budget meeting. Sounds good. Right? Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, are these at 6 30 or 7? 6 30. Okay. 6 30. Um, meeting is the same day. Um, and then good. tentative, is that the term? It's going to be. If you wait, and once, uh, once, once the joint. Uh, what's the August date? Does somebody have a date on that? Joe, do you remember that date, Joe? Yes. Yes. You moved that date. Joe wanted to move it, but I actually don't want to move it because my son's wedding is right then. Oh, oh yes. my God. Okay. Yeah. That's not it. Is it on a toner? Yeah. Well, so it's kind of the rough. August meeting would be on the 18th. Okay. okay. So the past of the August meeting, you would have to have the tentative budget passed before July 18th. 
Okay, is that the wedding date or is that your wedding in July? I that never is, that. That, that I I don't want to have the uh, wedding is the twenty first, and I want to have the, all this done. I do not want to sandwich board packet week wedding budget meeting okay, so, public hearing. So that would be so, awful. Can we do that? His date that he picked or no? No, is that good? No, no, no. not public hearing week. No. <laughs> I feel like, you know, who's on first? Uh, <laughs> I, I so now the July 18th date for a tentative doesn't work. How about if we do this? How about if we do this? How about if we turn now? I'll take a look at the calendar. And we'll talk about um, it. And I'll, I'll put a proposal together for you to consider. Okay, but are, are the June 16th dates solid? Uh, you know, I think they're fine. You have to check with Olivia. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I will do is okay. I'll start at the August uh, meeting and I will work backwards right. and I will make a proposal that you can consider tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, that's right. We'll be back here tomorrow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, excuse me. Um, yes. Yes. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. Okay, the special board meeting for the budget workshop of June 2nd is now adjourned. Thank you all. Say aye. 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 aye.